Um, <coughs> are you you did that yesterday, did you? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Jimmy. Thank you. Okani Kaukia. Wakataka Ti Hao Ki Te Ulu. Wakataka Te Hao Ki Te Tanga. Kema Kina Kina Ki Uta. Kema Tana Tana Ki Tai. Ehi Ake Ana Te Akakura. He Tio He Kuha. He Hao Hu. Ti He Mauriola. Kira. Kira. Thank you very much. Um, just to uh, 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 provide some information in terms of the course of the meeting this morning, uh, we have uh, the lunch adjournment is uh, planned for between 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, and um, we have the supplementary agenda uh, item uh, that we were to add to the agenda today, uh, the uh, item number 36. The new loan application from Ototahi Urban Guild has been withdrawn, so no council consideration uh, of that matter is required at this time. Um, yeah, I, I just um, uh, will note too that uh, there have been some uh, meetings that have been ongoing in relation to item 13, which is Cranford Street, Innes Road, Berwick Street improvements. And, uh, and a number of the deputations relate to that this morning. So um, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to have to put that to, the, uh, to this afternoon's agenda, the, the afternoon part of the meeting. Um, it's, uh, there, there is a lot of, obviously, interest in the matter, and a number of the deputations, as people will hear, uh, are raising quite significant issues, which we do need to have um, our staff speak uh, to the staff of the other agencies and the connecting district council. So um, I'm, I'm happy to move that to later on in the agenda. It probably will be around 3 p.m., um, but I can't um, fix a time, but that's, it's likely to be around, around 3 o'clock this afternoon. Um, and uh, so now I'll move on to uh, apologies, and I have an apology from Sarah Templeton and an apology for lateness uh, from <coughs> Councillor Sam MacDonald. Um, moved by Pauline Cotter, seconded by Tim Scandrit. I'll put that motion. <coughs> All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Uh, the next... Um, oh, <laughs> Sam's just arrived. <laughs> well done. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah, w one split second sooner and you wouldn't have been included in the apology. Um, Declarations of interest, I haven't received any for today's meeting, uh, and so I'll move on to public uh, participation and invite um, Imagination Station Sam Butcher to come forward. Thank you. Uh, tēnā koutou and uh, good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you all, and thank you for having me this morning. Uh, for those I haven't had the chance to meet personally, uh, kia ora, my name is Sam Butcher, and I have the privilege of running Imagination Station, which is a charity running social enterprise Lego education, and uh, we do that in conjunction with the city libraries and other entities around the city, and um, it's just wonderful to, to have that opportunity. I wanted to come this morning for two reasons. Firstly, to thank you all for your support throughout the last year. And secondly, to share with you some of the successes that we've been able to have in light of the challenges that there have been this year. So firstly, I simply want to recognise and thank this council for your support this year through director's fees and through the discretionary response fund that have enabled us to maintain and develop our offerings at Tōranga and beyond around Christchurch. So on behalf of my team and on behalf of Christchurch, thank you for that support. Uh, you have enabled us to thrive. And I think it's important that this council is proud of what you have enabled us to do because of your support. I think it's important to note that this support has not only been at a financial level, but also through excellent relationships that we've been able to have with a number of different council staff. So thank you very much for that. Our organisation, much like this council, believes that community partnership is 
the best way to find the best outcomes. And we believe that our relationship with this council is a testament to that in action. Imagination Station's agility as a, smart, as a small grassroots social enterprise has given us the ability to do a huge amount of good for our community with a relatively minuscule budget. And so once again, thanks for supporting us as we support tens of thousands of Christchurch kids and families. Secondly, I wanted to briefly share with you several highlights of our work over the last year. As a number of you are aware, in January, we launched our mobile education van, which enables us to take our courses to schools around Christchurch and also make the most of other community spaces around the city, including other community libraries. Uh, thanks to this initiative, we have been able to run holiday courses at South Library and New Brighton. We've even launched a weekly after school class in New Brighton, which has been very well received. And we are excited to also be offering a new after school class in South Library in term one next year. And so it's very exciting to be expanding that horizon. And it's exciting for those communities as well that we're able to tap into and offer more opportunities in this space. Uh, this year we also launched our very first girls only after school class, which enables young girls to engage with science and technology in a safe and encouraging environment of like-minded girls, which is much needed in the current environment, uh, given that a lot of these industries can typically be quite male dominated. So providing opportunities for them to really engage in a safe space has been very well received. Lastly, over the last couple of years, we've had the privilege of working with the University of Canterbury and also with the library's education team to offer science and technology courses for homework clubs on the east side of the city. <coughs> with the support of Ministry of Pacific Peoples, these courses have been a huge success and we're continuing to grow these over the coming years as we look at adding additional levels to really upskill those communities. So we're looking forward to working on that partnership as we go forward as well. These are just a few of the highlights we've had over the last year or so, and we hope that you are all encouraged by the work that we're doing. I am aware that there are several conversations happening at the moment about how we might partner with this council at a longer term level, and I look forward to seeing the outcomes of these conversations over the coming months as well. So I have tried to keep this very brief as an update. I'm aware there's a lot going on this morning, but uh, thank you all for your time, and uh, I hope that you have some time to digest this information as you are uh, kind of carry on in your meeting. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. It's, it's very much appreciated that you've come and given us an update. We're, we're just thrilled with um, what we see happening in, in Tūranga in particular, but we know that through your presentation that you take it out into <coughs> the wider community. So keep the imagination going for our young people. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Um, the next one is, uh, these are all deputations by appointment, so they're in relation to specific items on the agenda. Um, so I'd like to invite the Cancer Society and Community and Public Health uh, from the CDHB to talk to item 21, Amendment to Smoke-Free Public Places Policy. And we've got um, Amanda Dodd and uh, Lee Tuki. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, he mihi nui ki a koutou, tēnei ata nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Lee Tutuki Tifu, tifu Tifaru Tuku Ingoa, and I'm here with Amanda Dodd from the Cancer Society, and we're both members of Smoke Free Canterbury. So we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to support the paper encouraging smoke free public policies places policy. Yesterday, regulations came into effect seeking to increase the range of controls on vaping products, aiming to prevent the normalisation of vaping and to protect young people from marketing and promotions of vaping products. In alignment with the purpose of legislation, we encourage Council to extend the current smoke-free policy and endorse the inclusion of vaping. Over the past few years, you would have noticed 
huge media um, attention to vaping. And without effective regulations, the vaping market has expanded rapidly, with many vaping products available in New Zealand. A briefing sheet has been made available to all of you um, councillors, and to avoid us going into too much detail about the vaping products, um, I'd like to hand over now to Amanda to talk to you about the health impacts of vaping. Tēnā koutou katoa, councillors. So whilst we acknowledge that vaping can indeed help some people quit smoking and that vaping is less harmful than tobacco, we are aware that it is not entirely harmless. Vaping products are not meant to be lifestyle products, but are solely for use in supporting people to stop smoking. The Ministry of Health advice is only vape to quit smoking, and if you don't smoke, don't vape. There has been much concern voiced nationally by our school leaders via the Principals Association of New Zealand about the significant increase of young people vaping. A likely contributor to this will have been the, up until now, unregulated promotions that have really excessively targeted young people. A recent New Zealand study, the Youth 19 survey, actually found that 40% of regular vapors, of regular young vapors, had never indeed smoked cigarettes and were new entrants to the, vipotine, the vaping and then nicotine market. We need to be aware that some vaping products have exceptionally <coughs> high levels of nicotine, which does affect cognitive development, particularly during that vulnerable adolescence time. The long-term health impact of vaping is unknown at this stage. But we do know that many of the products contain significant toxicants, which have shown associations with respiratory diseases like asthma and lung disease. And this has really caused enough concern for key organisations like the World Health Organisation and our own, Cancer Society of New Zealand, to call for a cautious approach to electronic nicotine delivery systems. So as Lee indicated at the start of this presentation, including vaping is entirely consistent with one of the key purposes of the new Act, which is to prevent young people from initiating smoking and to prevent the normalisation of vaping in our communities. It is consistent with Council's own smoke-free policy to reduce exposure to toxicants in public places, and the Fresh Air Project, which Council has supported and endorsed since its inception, has proven that smoke-free and vape-free spaces in outdoor areas are acceptable to the public as the public become more concerned about the health impacts and the environmental damage from litter. We should also remember that most people are respectful of restrictions, these kinds of restrictions, in shared public places. Including vaping also would reduce any ambiguity, so it makes consistent messaging and is less confusing to the public. Also to bear in mind, as the report, which will be tabled later in this meeting, sets out there are many councils who have introduced and included vaping into their smoke-free public places policy for similar reasons outlined here. In relation to the environment, including vaping would help and contribute to reducing environmental impact of tobacco litter and vaping litter. And this really does align to the impact and the aspirations of stewardship of the land. Also contributes to your outcome, safe and healthy communities. So when we look at reviewing the smoke-free public policy places, policy, um, this really does give us an opportunity to look forward and look at the potential to expand smoke-free public spaces. Smoke-free policies are, have proven to be acceptable to the public, and more and more people are concerned about health impacts and environmental impacts. Indeed, Council's own consumer survey showed strong support for including vaping in the smoke-free policy. And if we look and we take this um, graphic here, these are key findings from a six-month trial in Hamner Springs Village, which was a smoke-free, vape-free zone, and that shows that nine out of ten visitors 
7 out of 10 residents and 6 out of 10 businesses endorsed the retention of that smoke-free, vape-free zone as a permanent feature for the village. That was then actually endorsed by Hurunui District Council to become a permanent feature for Hamner Springs. So good signage with consistent and positive communications would support the policy and signage can be rolled out as part of the renewals process for council, including new developments as they become operational. We would also like to ask for council support for Smoke Free Canterbury members to work with council staff and the business community to explore the potential to widen smoke free public spaces for Christchurch City. I'll now hand back for leave for closing comments. Thank you, Amanda. We'd like to acknowledge the strong leadership of council and the smoke free over the years with many anchor projects like the health precinct with embracing smoke free. Mm -hmm. Let's be ambitious about health and well-being for all of our people as we are about the growth and development of our city. The two concepts can coexist. Smoke-free, vape-free spaces support equity by linking people to behavioural support to quit smoking whilst limiting the exposure of smoke-free smoking and vaping behaviours for non-smokers. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for your time, and we're happy to answer any questions now. We have a couple of minutes, so um, just um, thank you for your presentation. I, um, because I have no real knowledge of vaping, um, I guess the issue that you've raised that I wasn't so aware of uh, was the um, disposing of the waste products. I never even thought of them as having waste products, but... Um, can you describe what sort of problem that creates for us? Because, I mean, that is an issue on beaches and, and the different places where we currently prohibit smoking and would extend this to. Absolutely. There's more and more concerns from the public health field about the environmental impact. And as you know, you've got very strong public support for, for cleaner, greener spaces for Christchurch City. Um, basically, in essence, toxicants can leak into water systems, um, obviously in terms of air quality that that is a factor but a lot of tobacco that cigarettes and vaping products actually use a lot of plastics so that that's another issue that we that we need to be concerned of thank you do we have any other questions uh tim It's now going. The smoke-free signs that we've got throughout our sports fields, etc. I mean, the re it's been outstanding. Everyone's taken that up, and it's um, you know, if anyone ever did turn up with a cigarette, you know, like the, the dirty looks you get, it just doesn't work, which is fantastic. With the upgrade though of all our signage to include vaping, is there a possibility that that you, you guys can assist us with that? Because there is a cost to that, and there's no, for me, there's no question that it's a good good thing to do. But it does take time to do. But if, yep. if you could assist us as a council with the finance to do that in some way, shape, or form, to assist in the speed of that would be really good. Well, the, um, that's a really good question. There are some free signs available, but they're limited number. And we had thought about that as you um, uh, have a plan to replace current signs, then that would be the, the best opportunity to include that. So using the free signs in the hotspots yeah. in the interim would be you know, a really good start, and that would be at no cost. Thank you. Yep. That's very good. Well, that brings us to the and end certainly of I your I have brought pop, a prop time. with me today oh, to, just um, to give you some, some thoughts about signage. But we have worked with Ashburton District Council, who have included vaping in their policy, um, to make sure that the signage was available at all the public spaces. So we do have Cancer Society and Community and Public Health have developed our own signage interim before the national signs become available. So that could be mm. a potential for council. Great. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we move on to um, item 22, South Shore and South New Brighton Earthquake Legacy Project. And if I could invite the South Shore Residents Association, uh, Meg Rolston and uh, Simon Watts, please. Good morning and welcome. Hi. Good morning. Kia ora koutou, Madam Mayor, Councillors, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. 
I'm Meg Rolston and this is Simon Watts. We're here representing South Shore Residents Association and we're speaking um, only in regard to the South Shore part of, of the report in front of you. Uh, we emailed extensive notes um, regarding the staff report and as we've only got 10 minutes we will um, we'll take that email as read and I'll just summarise the points today. This has been a long journey for South Shore community. We've lived with the effects of the earthquake damage to our estuary edge, the agency withdrawal, the rubble the, and the lack of repairs for over nine years. The process for this beautiful and connected community has been arduous. Dr John Cook, a GP in New Brighton, eloquently said in his deputation in May last year, when Regenerate Christchurch withdrew from the area, that the continued uncertainty around the management of equity and safety in the future of the community in South Shore and South Brighton has led many residents to dark and unhealthy places. The earthquake ruptured our village. Your decision corrodes our soul. Our ground continues to shake as we and our families grow old. I want you to bring humanity to the estuary edge we live by. We need you to resolve our fate so in peace in our land we can lie. South Shore Residents Association are pleased to finally have before you today a resolution to fund and complete these earthquake legacy repairs. We support the recommended unit approach repair, repair strategy with the view that it is an ecologically appropriate erosion and inundation solution to resolve the earthquake legacy issues of the estuary edge. The Residents Association want to be very clear we do not support the priority repair approach. We also support the recommended new engineered bund to 11.4 metres at the current Linz bund position. The acceptance Prioritise funding and implementation of both the unit approach repair and the new bund by council will create a platform for future sea level, coastal sea level rise and adaptation discussions. We believe implementing the unit approach repair and the new bund will increase the well-being of our South Shore community and enhance the amenity value of this ecologically and aesthetically valuable area for all the city to enjoy. We ask that you add a note to the resolution that specifically prioritises funding for this project be made available under the 2021 annual plan rather than just the long-term plan. The South Shore Residents Association would like to thank the project staff Gary Teer, our community representative expert, and Derek Todd at Jacobs for the extensive work done and the positive outcome achieved. We thank our community board members and area councillors, both past and present, for the support that has contributed to where we stand today. Lastly, but most importantly, we thank our wonderful community of South Shore for being supportive and tirelessly patient. Today, we ask you all councillors to support the recommended unit approach and the 11.4 metre bund that, and that you recommend that funding be made available for implementation of the Estuary Edge earthquake legacy repair in 2020 and urgently prioritise as per the 2019 resolution you already agreed. So that now in peace in our land we can lie. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any? <laughs> Do we have any questions, James? I, I don't. Uh, I'll try and phrase this as as a question. So I'll do it in te reo uh, ka, ka aroha ki a koto ki te community uh, or South Shore. Um, so can I just confirm what you do not support in this paper? In that paper, uh, the report set out two potential strategies, but they have only recommended the unit approach, I see what and so yeah. we we want to make it clear that that is the approach that um, we support. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Please um, support the officer's recommendation. Yeah. Okay. And then the other thing is, uh, are you aware, and you made a request about the, the uh, budget being in the 2021 annual year? The uh, annual plan as opposed to the focus the on the LTP, LTP yeah. which is the You mean for next plan. year, of course. It, it you're means for next year. Next year, not this year. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you're aware that the timing is not quite right for the years that you mentioned, but we're, we're going to give it due yeah. consideration. I okay. guess we um, put yeah. that in because that was in the original resolution oh, and right. it didn't happen yeah. and we're hoping that it will. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, but that, that is a question we can ask of staff when we get staff here for the consideration of the paper itself. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Kia ora. Are there any other questions? No? Oh, look, thank you very much for, um, d was there something further you wanted to say? Uh, simply that we are talking about the South Shore. Yeah, no, I, we, we understand that and we've had some uh, correspondence from the South New Brighton ones as well, which we'll address obviously when we get to the paper as well. Um, we, um, yeah, but I, I just wanted to say thank you. I just think, um, you know, I made a comment yesterday in relation to the, uh, uh, the coastal adaptation um, approach that, that we adopted with the establishment of the working group and um, you know I said it just felt so different from 2016 or 2015 whenever it was um, when we started off uh, that element of the coastal hazards chapter which mm. uh, you know was was a very challenging and difficult space for everyone uh, concerned. Supporting this will go a long way in our community. To, I know to and, and I think that I think that um, today is going to feel quite different from previous times where we've <coughs> tried to resolve some of these issues because I think it's important to get that um, proverbial and actual line in the sand um, in terms of a way to move forward on, on other matters as well. So thank you very much for your hard work and for your presentation today. And I just did want to comment on how excellent it was to bring in the external yeah. um, support of Gary Teer. It was useful. Um, thank you. Thanks. You too. Uh, right, now we move on to item 13, which is the Cranford Street, Inners Road, Berwick Street improvements, and uh, the first up is uh, Duncan Webb, local member of parliament. Thank you. Kia ora koutou katoa. Sit my microphone. Kia ora koutou katoa, and look, thank you very much for um, allowing me to present. It is, it is a real privilege uh, to be here, and you'll be aware that in terms of the um, community of St Albans and Marahu, this is a, this is a really significant issue, um, and I, I hope I won't take too long because it's really just a few brief points that I want to make. Um, and I did circulate uh, these uh, PowerPoint slides earlier. Yes, it's just gone onto the hub, so if people want to pull it up, that, that it's there. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and obviously this is about the downstream effects of the Northern Corridor. And as noted in the agenda items, it's really about how we use the additional lane space on Cranford Street um, from Innes Road to uh, Berwick Street. Um, and I really want us to focus on what principles we are applying here uh, and what weighting we should be giving them. Um, and there's one on that list where I haven't really got that I did want to add, and that is our partnership, our really important partnership um, with Waimakariri District Council um, and also with ECAN around public transport. And I, I think that's probably something that should go into the mix as well. Um, but here we have um, those principles that I'd really like us to hold at the forefront of our mind. And I put uh, the reduction of carbon emissions at the top um, for a very good reason. That is the largest challenge uh, that we've got facing us in New Zealand and around the world today. Um, but equally protecting our, our living environment, our residential areas and so on. Um, and also putting public transport as a priority, as a form of transport that's the most accessible to the most number of people. Um, and of course, um, cycling and other forms of transport, making those corridors um, cyclable, but also pleasant um, and effective to walk down as well, um, and effective and safe travel. 
And then I've just noted that we do have a perhaps somewhat outdated, but nevertheless it is our uh, strategic plan from 2012, um, and it identifies those items there. And in the text of it, I'm sure you're familiar with it, it does talk about environmental enhancements, talks about carbon emissions there, perhaps not with the headline that it would have uh, today, but it is still in there as a very important um, factor that we need to emphasise. And then, um, because everybody likes pictures, really just trying to set the scene of the choice that's here in front of us. You know, um, Waimakariri has made some hard decisions around how to manage um, and how to utilise uh, the Northern Corridor. Um, it's imposed rates increases on its residents so that it can have that uh, express bus service. Um, and here we have, of course, the fact that this council has declared a climate emergency. And I guess I'm urging this council to put its money where its mouth is uh, in terms of how it addresses, addresses those issues. Um, and look, uh, I want to make it clear that this is really a schematic, um, but I want us to think about what each decision might do. So the first line there is a high occupancy vehicle lane, um, which might be full time, including buses, cycles and high occupancy vehicles, and ask the question of what it actually would do. Now those, I, I was going to play around with the little ticks and big ticks in terms of the weighting, so there's no real weighting around there, but it was beyond me. But what it does show you is what we're achieving. Um, and you can see that uh, a high occupancy vehicle lane would encourage the use of public transport. It would lower the use of single occupancy vehicles or conversely increase the use of multi occupancy vehicles. It would lower carbon emissions. It would reduce tra traffic. It would ease congestion. Um, it also would link up, and I think this is important, it would link up with what's going on on the Northern Corridor itself, which has a high occupancy vehicle lane. Um, and the one thing that, look, I admit my community is interested in, it wouldn't preserve parking if it was uh, a full-time um, arrangement. So some parks or a number of park and parking amenities would be lost on Cranford Street. So that's one option that's under consideration, um, and one which I think would be a, a good decision. Another good decision would be a bus and cycle priority lane in peak time. Um, and obviously that has some um, alternatives in the sense that that parking would become available um, when it wasn't being used. Uh, and certainly I accept that for some businesses down Cranford Street, particularly on the Westminster intersection, uh, that would be interesting um, and, 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 and attractive. Um, but it, was, it is a different traffic management uh, approach than that which is on the northern arterial. Um, now, I want to recognise the work that the community board's done um, and the voluminous submissions that were put in front of them and that they worked through um, assiduously. Um, but having said that, uh, their approach of, which is, I've called it do nothing, um, but perhaps would be more honestly called wait and see, um, really has very little benefit at all. Um, and of course the other downside of it is that it would um, possibly see us leave the traffic management as it is and then change it again, which is confusing for drivers and residents and so on, have a lead in period and of course require not a huge cost but some cost in changing the traffic management plan. So doing nothing has very modest effects, if any. Um, it's it's uh, certainly not going to assist us in reducing uh, emissions and in increasing the use of public transport or any of those other objectives that we want. Probably, however, the worst of all, of all possible worlds would be a clear way, and this is Whilst it gets an extra tick, the fact of the matter is that all that a clearway would do would be to encourage more traffic. And that must be the opposite of what we really want. And we know that whilst it might ease congestion in the short term, the fact of the matter is that if you create roads, cars will come. Um, and so it would, in fact, uh, the, any easing of congestion would be in the short term. Um, it would do the opposite of uh, lessened traffic, it would in fact increase traffic, and that's something which I hope this council is, you know, strategically opposed to. So look, 
I think it's clear um, that if we want to address some of the big challenges that face us in terms of moving people effectively and safely in large numbers, in terms of reducing emissions, in terms of preserving our communities, uh, those top two options are by, by far and away uh, the better ones. I'm, you know, in some ways, I think high occupancy vehicle is the better of the two, but I'm, I'm relatively agnostic between the, the th those. In terms of doing nothing or putting a clear way, that would be a really a retrograde step, given the fact that these are you know real challenges um, that face us in terms of the community today. Um, I promised I'd be short. Um, that really is uh, all I've got to say today. Just in terms of the degree of agnostic um, approach to the first two, uh, wouldn't it be more in line with what uh, the, the, the goals are to um, prioritise um, buses? Yeah, I can see that. So the advantage of uh, the bus and cycle lane is is exactly that. It's and, and I absolutely endorse a focus on public transport. On the other hand, a but high it, occupancy. It ties in with what Waimakariri have already done, surely, and that they've they've gone out and consulted with their community, and 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 very courageously um, proceeded with the park and ride option. Uh, in order to support it, we've got the express bus buses being provided by ECAN. So, on that basis, wouldn't you think that the third leg of the treble was the preferential treatment of buses? And it was lovely to see you at the races. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a treble. But you look like look. I, I'm, I'm not going to fight you on this one. I mean, the high occupancy vehicle lane educates drivers about filling up cars as well, so it has some merit. Um, but I can entirely see a bus priority lane as being a very good outcome. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions? No. Good. Look. Thank you, you very thank much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, the ne <laughs> next one is uh, Waka Kotahi, New Zealand Transport Agency. Michael Bly Levin. Uh, kia ora everyone. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Waka Kotahi is the New Zealand Transport Agency and we are a partner and co-investor with Christchurch City Council in the Christchurch Northern Corridor improvements. Um, that project has introduced 10 kilometres of high occupancy vehicle lanes uh, coming into the city and 15 kilometres of separated cycle paths. Um, those are there to encourage mode shift from single occupant vehicles. Um, in parallel, we are working with Environment Canterbury on improving the bus services uh, to support that and with all of our Greater Christchurch partners to encourage travel behaviour change to move more people and fewer vehicles. But change takes time and in the meantime, we've still got a lot of traffic on our arterial roads. And um, if we don't manage those roads appropriately, we run the risk that traffic starts to reroute and rat run through our local communities. She doesn't agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that bad, this <laughs> carry. And, and that rat running is the exact uh, effect and issue that the Environment Court recognised uh, when it set its consent conditions for the extension of the Northern Arterial and the Cranford Street improvements. And that required our Council to investigate the downstream effects management plan. Um, to recap, the, the Environment Court did note that the Council had deemed the, C, uh, the, the CNC necessary. Uh, to deliver a wide range of outcomes for the urban form, shape and growth of Northern Christchurch and Waimakariri, um, to, to move the traffic off uh, Main North Road in Belfast enabled um, a significant improvement in that urban space. Um, but it did also note that any additional traffic uh, may have an adverse effect on residents and businesses in the immediate area, hence referred to as the downstream effects. Uh, so what uh, was required of the downstream effects management plan uh, was to, for council to identify the preferred vehicle route um, such that uh, traffic was kept off other 
um, public transport corridors and cycling corridors. And that, in essence, reinforces the network management approach that we are jointly uh, working to, where we have identified Main North Road and Papua Nui Road as our preferred public transport route with the priority measures that we've put down there. Uh, the major cycle routes are running down uh, Rutland Street and Cranford Street is the traffic route as identified by the arterial status in the Christchurch City Plan. Um, so in the, the Environment Court's consent conditions uh, stated that the downstream effects management plan needed to manage traffic on Cranford Street such that it used the corridor rather than rerouting through those local neighbourhoods. And the target set was such that no more than 30% increase on those local streets was to occur. And that was to uh, be explored and mitigation measures identified from opening through to a commissioning period of 10 years. Um, in December, uh, and what, what the condition also required was because of the complex urban nature of this environment, they requested council to engage an independent expert traffic uh, engineer to come up with the mitigation plan. Um, and they were, uh, did refer to clearways, um, traffic calming measures, speed measures, um, for which the expert uh, uh, witness or the expert advisor uh, confirmed. And in December 2019, the Christchurch City Council approached Waka Kotahi for co-investment to implement those recommended improvements. And it was on the basis of including a clearway that can be managed uh, appropriately uh, that Waka Kotahi approved that funding. Uh, that funding also included the addition of a cycle connection from the Christchurch Northern Corridor through to uh, the major cycle route on Rutland Street, and that was our expectation. So it was uh, somewhat surprising uh, to see the community board recommending a change in scope to council that you'll be considering later today. Um, we believe that that is uh, potentially contrary to the advice of the independent expert uh, and uh, has a high likelihood uh, that you will get rat running through those local communities. In particular, the, the tricky constraint on this corridor is the traffic signal intersection at Innes Road. And the issue, the constraint that that has is where two lanes of traffic merge suddenly into one lane, and that's what causes uh, the back load of traffic further up Cranford Street. And human nature, is such that if I see a queue in front of me, I will duck off that corridor and rat run through the community. And that, we believe, is the last thing we want. That is uh, what we believe the Environment Court was asking us collectively to avoid. Um, and similarly, uh, that congested nature is not good for emissions in terms of stop-start <coughs> traffic, having traffic being able to be managed and uh, moving through the corridor. Uh, we do strongly support uh, public transport priority, and that can be incorporated into a clearway design uh, through that corridor. So, uh, in, in summary, I mean, we believe that the proposal that you uh, have before you may contravene that Environment Court consent requirement, and we do encourage Council to carefully consider that recommendation for you today, and we do request further discussion directly with Waka Kotahi, given our partnership and co-investment um, position. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, that was really good. Um, do you um, appreciate that the council has already implemented the um, rat running mitigation in that area through the surrounding streets? So would that then alter your view of encouraging rat running uh, because it's not possible anymore? Uh, no, in, in isolation, I don't believe there will. I mean, I, I cycle home every day through Collins Street, through the Addington community there, and there is a number of traffic calming measures through that, but I regularly see traffic uh, running through that neighbourhood. 
And as much as we like to think that some calming measures will make them stay away, I believe uh, that it's far better for us to manage the, our uh, arterial corridors appropriately. This is not about providing um, unabated capacity for single occupant vehicles. It's just about enabling the traffic that is there uh, to flow appropriately and then we can prioritise the modes um, as necessary through those corridors. So on its own, the, the calming measures I don't believe would uh, mitigate the Environment Court's concerns. And what about your view on the fact that if um, people do find um, this is getting congested through that from Innes Road to Berwick, that they may be encouraged to take the bus? rather than providing a clear way and enabling them to bring their car, which is actually contrary to the GPS? Uh, yes, uh, the, the key bus corridor is down Main North Road and Papua Nui Road, and if for people who can access that corridor um, effectively, there is a good mode transfer option for them. Mm. Um, you need to think about that. The buses in this corridor, the section between uh, what is the Cranford Street roundabout in the new configuration through to Innes Road. Everybody in that section is going to get hooked, held up, including any buses that are in that section as well. Mm -hmm. mm. But the part we're talking about today is south of Innes, between Innes and, and Berwick. Yeah, but my point yeah. is that, that what you do at that critical Innes intersection has an impact further back up into the corridor, which is where the expert witness identified the um, spill off and the diversion of traffic is likely to occur. Mm. And my last question, if I may, is that uh, providing a clear way will actually attract more cars, which means that will hit that 30 per cent increase threshold a lot earlier. Do you have a comment on that? Uh, I don't. It, it will manage the, the traffic that is in there. Um, the, it will not be such a great level of service that uh, it will attract more cars per se. It is about managing the cars that are in, the, in that corridor. And as I mentioned, I mean, the Clearway can facilitate buses, so therefore we are providing that mode choice option, which is what we're all collectively trying to achieve. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Aaron. Yeah, j just with your points around the um, uh, Environment Court and also uh, the um, agreement with NZTA, is there any consequences of going against that? or can we just kind of do it and you get told you shouldn't have done that, but that's it? Uh, I'm sure there are consequences and I'm sure your uh, council officers can advise you on the significance of that uh, more appropriately than I can. I think that you've got a, a meeting with staff this morning um, to take this further, is that right? Uh, I've got a meeting with the Oh, right. Okay. All right. Well, we shall we'll, we'll be considering the paper later in the afternoon. Thanks, Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Eva. Thank you. Um, Environment Canterbury, uh, <coughs> Councillor Phil Clearwater and Edward Riot. Maureen, Leanne, and councillors. Um, apologies from from Chair Jenny Huey. She has um, long term plan matters she had to attend to today, so you've got me. Um, and you would like. So, um, look, Environment Canterbury, uh, we're asking Council to decide on the option for the bus lanes at peak travel times only. Um, and just to make that clear how that would work, you probably know, but just to reiterate, um, in, in the morning time on Cranford Street, um, that bus lane w uh, it would operate as a lane only between 6 o'clock until 9 o'clock in the morning and starting at 6 to, to, uh, to allow the direct service from Waimakariri. Um, on, on, the, on, the south, on the southbound lane, and in the afternoon, for the, north, for the northbound travel, um, the times for the bus lane would be, say, between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock. So the bus lane on Cranford Street would work really just like other bus lanes on the busy um, streets and roads in, in Christchurch where um, the bus lanes, where we have them, work very well. The, um, also, the peak travel um, bus lanes, they support not only um, the direct services which are being launched um, for Waimakariri, um, and me, Dan Gordon, I'm sure, will speak about that soon, but also the bus service for Route 28, and that travels on Cranford Street and serves the local community. 
And although the report refers to um, the Cranford Street corridor having um, only limited bus service or occasional bus service, and I want to speak about that, because the number of buses using Cranford Street uh, when the express buses come online, as well as Route 28, will be seven buses each hour, or one every 15 minutes. Now that may not sound a lot, however, in fact, the, the num that number of buses using Cranford Street would be the same as the streets um, and roads where we've already got um, bus lanes throughout the city, and there are numerous examples that you'll be aware of. Um, and although um, Route 28 um, is currently has a frequency of just every 20 minutes, um, councils will be aware through the, the Public Transport Futures business case, which will go to central government, that there'll be an increase in the frequency of the service for that um, metro city connecting route. So while um, we understand the idea um, about waiting and seeing what the traffic volumes are going to look like. If there's significant congestion when this corridor opens or, or soon after, this would then have a huge impact on both the new direct services from Waimakariri and Route 28. And it could certainly put people off from using these services and it would be, be much harder to attract them back after such neg negative initial experiences. Duncan Webb uh, referred to climate change. And regarding climate change, I want to say that the report says that the option to undertake traffic monitoring will likely have limited impact on vehicle emissions. However, that's really an acknowledgement that it will not even start to address the fact that 53% of Christchurch's carbon emissions are due to tra uh, transport and largely due to single occupancy cars. So councillors will be aware that our current reliance on private vehicles is not sustainable long term. And travel demand on the Cranford Street corridor will only intensify. So support for the public transport infrastructure is actually vital to accommodate the increasing demand on Greater Christchurch's transport network. So today I'm asking you as councillors to support the part-time bus lanes option. That will be before you later. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for Phil? Um, Melanie. When's the express bus meant to start? I know it's meant to be after the arterial opens, but have you got a date? We, we do. Um, January the 11th. Oh, right. Specific. <coughs> Very good, thank you. To be precise. Coming soon. Um, Aaron? Yeah, just um, after some numbers, Phil, what are the, what's the current bus usership or usage from Waimakariri? Well, we've, we've yet to begin the, the, um, direct, the direct express service. Yeah. Okay. Well, how many people in Waimakariri currently catch the bus, not in their district, because that would be low, but from okay. coming to town versus...? Unfortunately, yeah. that's detail I can't answer off the top of my head. Um, right. But there is significant usage uh, in, in bus services from the Waimakariri district, that's both urban and school buses um, that in the mornings. I, yeah, I think those, those use Papua Nui yeah. Road currently and, and yeah. do things like serve schools on Papua Nui Road. These new express services will be complementary to that and really focused on central city workers. So, get, well, hopefully those numbers do exist on what currently is, but also a best case scenario model, like if there was express buses. Uh, there was park and ride, buses were free, um, they were more often, like the absolute utopian world of buses, well, how many people would be on them would be um, a really good number to see, so we can kind of compare, um, because uh, certainly the most hope in the St Albans area is around bus usage. Uh, I, I think myself, e-bikes, um, so a lever we're not pulling enough, but um, it would be good if those numbers do exist, if we could see them. Pauline. Yeah, thank you, and thank you very much for coming in. Um, and thank you, I'd like to thank you for actually taking the bold step and putting this express bus through from Waimakariri and Rangiora and Kaipoi. Um, and I'm just hoping, um, well actually my question is, what is ECAN's plan for electrifying the fleet? And will these um, buses have Wi-Fi on them? 
answer the second question first. Yes, yep. they will have Wi-Fi on them. Right. In right. terms of electrifying the fleet, we currently have three electric buses in Christchurch. By November next year, we'll have another 25. Wow. And there's ambition to continue growing that in the future. Thank you, because I think that would make these, this route really attractive, actually, too, if, you, if they could be electric as well. And, and of course, um, as, you're, uh, as you're picking up, Pauline, the electric buses being, being fast and, and quiet, no, no emissions at all, um, certainly we are hoping will be attractive to potential to increase potential patronage. Right, and just one more question. Have you thought about um, diverting the bus um, at Edgware Road to the east um, and then taking Manchester straight down into the city, the express? Sorry, do you mean the express route or Route 28? Just the express. Just the express. Well, the express route has flexibility uh, to to move to any road, uh, depending on what's fastest. Its first stop is not till further down Manchester. But it Street. won't rat run, will it? No, it no. won't rat run. <laughs> okay, that's good. But, but it could it could peel off at Edgeware Road onto Manchester Street right. if, if that was the appropriate way. It could peel off at uh, Berwick Street. And use Madras Street right. if, if that was sorry Barbados Street going south if that was the appropriate way as oh, well. Great. But certainly it would be using the section between Innes Road and Berwick Street yep. which you're considering today. Yep. Thank you. Mike. Thank you. Actually, Pauline asked all the questions I was going to ask. It's great to um, see your commitment on increasing the frequency for the 28. It would be good if they were electric buses right from the get-go. Um, and I guess another thing is, is how we actually, you know, start off with a great big bang and, and the potential of actually doing a, a period of free PT um, using that express route just to actually get people used to the, the service and actually how well it works could be a good good option. Um, and, and I guess the other thing, while I've got you there, um, are you looking at increasing the age of the child fair to 19 as per your... Um, Policy? We're certainly having discussions around um, and a whole review of the fair structure, Mike. And so, what you have hit on, certainly uh, a lot of us as councillors, and I speak personally, um, would like to see how, in fact, they, the fares are as affordable as possible, especially for families. Okay. Do, do you know the time frame around that fair review? It's. Yeah, we're, we're likely to be second half of next year for the, the fair review now, with long-term plan being the, the key considerations for the first half of the year. OK. Wouldn't they, shouldn't that all dovetail together, your long-term plan and the fair review? No. I, um, personally, Mike, I, I agree with you in terms of using all the levers that we have. I understand, though, in fact, there's a lot of, a lot of um, technical work is required for that review. Got 20 seconds, Yanni. Um, thank you. Um, just wanted to check, so you're supportive of the community board recommendations, is that correct? No, we, we're supportive that we're really asking council to decide on the option for the bus lanes at peak travel times only, which are my reading wasn't the community board option. Right, okay, so you're supporting option three. Yes. And have you talked to NZTA about supporting that option? Uh, well, we've, there's been a partnership here between uh, Christchurch City Council, Waka Kotahi and, and Waimakariri District. Uh, within that, there's probably divergent options uh, that we, that we uh, like, depending on our particular modes. Um, uh, HOV lanes would also uh, provide good service for, for bus passengers, and a clear way could as well. But uh, it seems to us that the bus lanes are a good option to look at for uh, when the, the HOV, sorry, when the Christchurch Northern yeah. Corridor opens. Thank uh, you. Shortly. And just to be clear, you're not part Thanks. of that. Thanks. Thanks the, very much. The three groups. That's good. Yeah. We're, we're getting full report back with the report this afternoon. Um, I, I don't know if you heard, but we're, we're going to deal with this matter this afternoon, not straight after we, the we understand that, community yeah. boards. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank could you I invite uh, Waimakariri District Council, uh, Mayor Dan Gordon and um, Chief Executive Jim Palmer? Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Um, <laughs> good morning, Your Worship. Um, we've got a copy of my uh, submission for each of you. Would you mind, it's okay if we hand it around?
Kia ora. Uh, would you like me to start, Your Worship? Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to be present uh, to the Council today. Uh, with me is our Council Chief Executive, uh, Jim Palmer. I'd like to um, acknowledge Mayor Leanne and Councillor Davidson and Templeton, who ably represent the city at the Greater Christchurch Partnership Table. Um, I have personally been delighted by the progressive and constructive way the partnership has worked during this term of Council. Today I'd like to provide some comments in regard to the Cranford Street improvements in this road to Berwick Street that you are considering later in your agenda. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Papua Nui Innes Community Board and the residents who have submitted on this issue. I note that the Community Board has recommended to the Council that it supports the design proposed by Christchurch City Council staff, maintaining the current road alignment, along with continuing to monitor traffic movements and effects. This reflects a valid community perspective, and I can understand why residents have submitted in this way to their community board and also the recommendation from the board um, who represent their interests. I believe it is equally important for the council to also consider the proposal from a Greater Christchurch Partnership perspective, particularly in relation to improving public transport and supporting mode shift from single occupancy vehicles to public transport, multi-passenger vehicles and other forms of multimodal transport, such as walking and cycling. With the creation of the Christchurch Northern Corridor has not been without issues. The planning for it has been anticipated for more than a decade as part of the wider land use in transport planning for Greater Christchurch. This wider plan has been endorsed by the partners, including Christchurch City Council, ECAN, NZTA, and Waimakariri District Council. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the City Council for the investment it has made to support the significant infrastructure project. As a partnership, we have worked hard to develop solutions to implement the strategy, including dedicated express buses, park and ride services, and a dedicated public transport in T2 lane on the corridor to reduce dependency on cars and support more sustainable transport solutions. The commitment to the Greater Christchurch Partnership. As Greater Christchurch Partners, we are all working towards getting as many people out of single occupancy cars as possible and supporting sustainable transport solutions. The Waimakariri District Council has been and is totally supportive of the work of the Greater Christchurch Partnership. The urban development strategy confirmed through that the Our Space process last year has supported the necessary commitments to infrastructure investments and district plan changes to cater for growth anticipated by the UDS. It's worth noting the Greater Christchurch residents work right across the sub-region. Of Waimakariri residents commuting to Christchurch for work, the latest census data shows about 17% are destined for, for inside the four avenues. Waimakariri District Council has allocated $4 million to support park and ride facilities, as well as several million dollars for cycleways to help support mode shift from <coughs> single occupancy vehicles. In the medium to longer term, Waimakariri District Council supports building on and expanding the park and ride services and improving public transport infrastructure as demand increases. There are five park and ride facilities under construction or due for construction in the coming months in Mangura and Kaiapoi. Direct bus express bus service, ex, sorry, direct um, bus service, express bus services will commence in January 2021, providing a major improvement to the commuter offering, both in terms of frequency and travel time. The Waimakariri District Council is fully committed to this initiative and is looking forward to a successful launch of the whole package along with increasing patronage over time. This is a key initiative to start addressing concerns about increasing traffic volumes using the Northern Corridor 
and to support commuting into the city on rapid transit buses. Importantly, following consultation by ECAN, the ratepayers in Waimakariri will also be paying up to an additional $30 per household per annum for the express bus service. When combined with the investment the Waimakari District Council is making, it represents a significant commitment. There is also an accompanying package of travel demand management initiatives planned by the partners to support the high occupancy lane on the Northern Corridor, including messages around rideshare, PT, public transport and other tra travel mode options such as walking and cycling. To make PT more attractive, it needs to be competitive, especially in terms of travel time. The high occupancy lane on the CNC provides this opportunity. However, to get the best benefit, this needs to be supported right along the length of the journey. The perception and reality of unpeated PT flow is vital to encouraging people to swap modes. The current design has the occupancy lane finishing on the CNC north of Cranford Street. We acknowledge that that section of Cranford Street between the CNC and Innes Road has been four-laned to manage the traffic demand in this area. However, there would be a missed opportunity if Cranford Street between Innes Road and Berwick Street is not given further consideration with regard to providing improved travel times for buses and possibly high occupancy vehicles, hence encouraging more use of PT and rideshare. So just reflect now on the, our Council's view on the options in the report. The Waimakari District Council does not support the proposal that has been recommended by the Papua Nui Innes Community Board. The other options presented in the report merit further consideration. Other than reviewing the report before you, we have not had the opportunity to undertake any detailed analysis of the options, nor appreciate uh, how the impact of the relevant corridor consent conditions have been considered as part of the analysis. On the face of it, Waimakari District Council considers that option two, peak hour, peak hour high occupancy vehicle lane, may well be the best long-term solution aligning uh, this part of the network with the approach being taken on the Northern Corridor. However, initially we appreciate that pursuing option three, peak hour bus only lane, may be more acceptable while still providing a number of benefits over the option recommended by the Community Board. In conclusion, while the recommended approach includes further monitoring, which the Waimakari District Council does support, we consider that broader Greater Christchurch Partnership objective, objectives should be also taken into account. The Council may want to consider laying this matter on the table to receive further advice and analysis from transport officers of all the relevant partners before it finally makes its decision. Thank you again for the opportunity to present today and we would be happy to answer any questions. There's a minute here. Um, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed for the um, deputation and for making your position um, very clear. Um, so option two is your preferred option, but you would find option three acceptable. Given your um, comments around um, mode shift onto PT, um, that surprises me a little bit. Why would you not just go for the bus lane rather than the um, T2 as your preferred option? Well, I think, I think what we're looking to do is if we're encouraging HOV vehicles, then obviously going through the whole way would be desirable. But look, I, I'm a realist politically, and I accept uh, where some of the position may be going. And from our pos position, having a bus lane at, at, at peak times would be more desirable than nothing at all. And, and from our perspective, that, but if we're to make that change, to see that bus go past you in the morning, it's how you're going to convince people to make that change. And that's why we're making that investment, considerable investment in our district to make that happen. And we've looked at a variety of options, taken a number of studies. We, th we, th we think we're on the right track with that and we'll do our best to encourage our people to make that change. Thank you.
Thank you very much. It's much appreciated and um, we appreciate the effort that you've made to come in and present to us. Uh, you may not have heard, but um, we're, we're um, going to deal with this later on this afternoon as there's further advice that we need to take as a result of the deputation. So thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much again. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the last one is in relation to item um, 18, Central City Residential um, Programme Supply, uh, Lindsay Carswell. <coughs> I've got my wave from the crowd. <laughs> well, good morning, all. Um, before I actually start, I just want to make a couple of points. This um, submission I've done for you <laughs> It was done in quite a bit of a hurry, actually, so if I'd had more time, I might have used a few different words or checked the spelling or other little bits and pieces. Um, and also, I just want to um, advise you that I've, over the last couple of years, I've had quite a lot of eyesight problems, so I find it difficult to actually read. So if I've got a magnifier, it still doesn't um, help all that much. But anyway, let's get into what I've got here. You'll recall that a few months back, um, when you were looking at the... Um, the rebate scheme, I did a supply and demand analysis. <coughs> I guess trying to, it, was, it ended up almost at uh, year 13 level when I was teaching economics or seven form level for bursary and scholarship economics. And I guess trying to do a week's work in five minutes was pushing it a little bit. So I don't think most of you really understood what I was actually trying to get at there. But what I was tr trying to point out to you is that the subsidy to the developer ends up in the developer's hands. It does not end up in the purchaser of the unit or the house in the central city. Very little of that subsidy goes to the purchaser. It goes to the developer, it goes into his profits, or it may pay for some of the costs, we'll never know. So that's the first thing. I want to say, but the point that I noticed so in this item 18 is this view is still persisting in that report that the contribution goes to the purchaser. If you have a look through the agenda item, which I had to read through a couple of times, um, page two, three, four. It's got there, assuming that the savings are re reflected in the sale price, price drops. Um, page 245, supply side is going on about there, the savings and development, etc., etc., <coughs> and so on. You've probably read the report anyway, and you would have come across those. Well, I hope you've read the report. Anyway. <coughs> After I spoke about the developer contributions previously in June, I sent an email to the council and asked, well, how does this actually work? What is the mechanism that it ends up in the hands of the um, purchaser? And I got an email back from council under Dawn Baxendale's name, office under her email. The email wasn't signed off by anybody, so I don't know who actually wrote it. But anyway... <coughs> It goes on to say, um, which I've written out there, <clears throat> and you would have read that. But I, so what it's saying is, it's not true that the developer passes on the rebate to the purchaser. Now, if it were true, then there would be a mechanism, some means for that money to go to the purchaser. It doesn't happen. <clears throat> the agenda of item 18 is signed on that point. It doesn't say, just makes a bland statement. Let's move on a bit. Let's have a look at some supply factors. I do not believe that the cost structure of building in the inner city differs much from building in the other suburbs around the central city area. <clears throat> Uh, an examination of William Corporation. Now, 
The figures I've taken here are straight off their website. I'm using their design because they're, they use a cookie cutter approach to building. They build the same thing everywhere. So you can do a comparison throughout the city where they've been building. And if you look carefully, you'll find that what they've built in the central city and what they've built in the suburbs, price-wise, there's very little difference. There's a range of prices, I know, and a range of prices in the central city and a range of prices round. But the prices don't reflect that there's a price problem in the central city area. <clears throat> in my view, the rebate is just adding to the profit of the developer. Totally waste of money. As far as, concerned, as far as our rates are concerned. Let's have a look at some demand factors. I'd just like to mention just one, which I believe hasn't been looked at, and I believe it's actually the elephant in the room. And that is that over the last 50 odd years, Christchurch City has become a homogenised city. You've got shopping, housing everywhere, scattered throughout the whole city. Look how many shopping malls we've got. We've Dozens of them. People no longer have to come into the central city to work or to shop. So the demand for central city housing and business space, in fact, has declined. And that's the problem. It's taken 50 years. You've achieved it. You go to Dunedin, they don't allow it. There are no shopping malls in Dunedin except in the central city. And I'd be wanting to say, I do not believe, apart from Auckland, that any city is as homogenised like we are. All right. I'm not going to take up much time. Conclusion. A couple of points I just want to make here. Um, it's clear that the council is not certain who gains from the, the DC rebate. I would strongly urge... I plead with you, go back and reconsider that decision you did in June. You have squandered so far 13 million, you're going to squander another 7 million on it. It is a waste of money. Th thank Get you, it. Lindsay. We don't have that item on our agenda. No, today. I know, but and I'm just urging the, you to do sorry, that. Sorry, I've been very gracious in terms okay. of the deputation. So All right, in my you. view, final note, my view, the lack of uptake in the housing in the inner city is due to planning decisions that have been made over the last 50 odd years. Homeowners and businesses have abandoned the central city for the suburbs. I don't know how you're going to get them back. And that's what I want to say. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Uh, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is presentation of petitions. Uh, there, were, um, there are no presentation of petitions. And now we'll move on to the uh, council minutes, which I will move. Seconded by James Daniels. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. And now we move on to the community board reports. Um, thank you very much. And the uh, next, the first one is uh, Waihoro Sprayed and Kashmir Community Board. Welcome, oh sorry, welcome Carolyn Potter, thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is the photograph of the meeting that we held. Shut up, you. <laughs> You've got, you have got enough on your plate at the moment. Um, you're, not in a you're not in a presidential debate now, so none of that shut up business. <laughs> um, this, board, this was our board meeting that was held at Addington School, and one of those two children who are presenting to us standing up 
was in the, um, the um, pedestrian cage outside Eddington School on Brom Street when the car struck it last week. Um, and the cage is still dented. We've asked for it to be repaired. Um, the, these, this was the presentation about um, separating pedestrians, probably a tunnel underneath Brougham, from Brougham Street um, um, because of the near misses and the no, not near misses that have occurred on that pedestrian crossing over the years. There were there were several people from the community in the gallery that presented on the issue at the time. Um, these are, we, we've had a three meeting, two meetings outside this year, and we will be having another one. The Huntsbury Community Centre will hold a meeting there in December, and we're finding it really useful to hold one of our ordinary meetings in the community. Um, the big change that has occurred in my time in uh, council and board meetings is the public forum, which has been wonderful for us. We have an average of four public forum presentations from local organisations and residents, and uh, these are examples of some of the people who have presented to us. Andrea Webb requesting a new reserve, updates from key local organisations such as the Apawaho Heathcote River Network Trust, which is an extraordinarily valuable organisation in our area in, in terms of the Apawaho uh, River. Suburbs Rugby and the Crossover Trust, which has just acquired camping grounds uh, directly opposite Spencer Park, where they have um, uh, cabins and um, tent sites in which they aim to develop as a, uh, for young people and families and accessible to all. Jacqueline Chester uh, requesting safer pedestrian routes on the new Worsley's Road area. Innovating streets teams, but all of them have presented to uh, the community board and will present again to us at the next meeting. An 84-year-old requesting a new basketball court for local kids. Basketball is, as we all know, the coming thing. And Youth Achievement and Development Fund recipients coming back to the board to tell them what they did with our support um, in their adventures around New Zealand and overseas. Well, not so much overseas at the moment, actually. We have the Edible and Sustainable Garden Awards um, coming up, and we're hoping that there will be an involvement from schools. And we have we start our meetings with the Waiata, and this is the Waiata that we sing. We're getting better and better, actually. We, we were a disaster at the beginning. <laughs> but we are getting better and better. Um, and the involvement of the Māori language in our community board meetings is um, heartening to all of us. And today we have the Pacifica Fiesta, a Hunhei Fiesta, and the Pacifica Rugby League competition, uh, Christchurch wide, um, at Hunhei in Mazes Park, starting this afternoon at three o'clock. Very good. That, last time I watched the New Guinea team absolutely being thrashed, massacred. Most of them were academics from Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the end of the presentation? Yep. Right, OK. Any questions? Uh, Melanie? Did you want to mention Oh, I want to talk about Greg. Oh, um, right. One of our, just briefly, yeah. just briefly, one of our um, um, very active members of the community uh, was Greg Smith, who died in his sleep at the age of 44 last week. Oh. He had been active in, um, all, in every area of the community's life, but he was particularly um, um, a, a, an employee of what used to be called Addington Net, became TechMate, and later on they, were, they, he and Linda were setting up their own organisation. He was the nicest man. That's what we all said about him. He was the nicest man. And it was a bit of a heartbreak um, when going to his funeral with Melanie. Um, but I have to say, I gained a jacket out of it because we had to leave from one meeting, dash into farmers, grab a jacket, and swan get to the funeral on time. Where we, we spoke, I spoke on behalf of Melanie and I and the board about his contribution to our community. Well, thank you for doing mm. that. Melanie. It wasn't what I was going to bring up, but I'm glad you remember. But the other thing that came up about him was that he had a PhD in chemistry, which we never knew. He was so humble. It was amazing. And, uh, top, um, and top scored 
Oh, at his school. Every subject, subject. at Christchurch Boys High, he was the top. Yeah. But um, the thing I was going to... Did you mention about the principals? Was that last time? Oh. Uh, the print, no, it was this time. It might be quite useful to yeah, mention. Yeah, oh, the print, we, we had a meeting with our school principals. This is the first one we've held. We were copying Linwood in um, having established, trying to establish this meeting. It was incredibly informative and a great exchange of views. And we had... Um, and you learn again that the principal's preoccupation is not necessarily with the children, though of course it is. It's buildings, 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 and traffic that sends them around the bend and, um, and, and, caught, and is a greater part of their workload. But it was a very interesting meeting, and we'll be glad to keep that going. And thank you, Linwood, for the, um, setting the example. And Pepper Nui. Yeah. Thank you. We should have Are there any other comments or questions? Oh, yeah. It's just so um, <laughs> Tim and Melanie to move and second. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you for getting it through in time, Nian. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, te Pātaka o Rā Kai Hotu, Banks Peninsula Community Board Report to Council. Um, Tori Peden. Chair, and it looks like we have um, Penelope with you. Welcome. Morena. Thank you. Morena. First slide. So, first slide is um, actually quite an interesting one. Last week, the board approved new um, EV charger parking P60 um, in Little River. This is to go next to the two existing P30s. Um, as you see on the chart in front of you, it's the uptake of um, used and new EV vehicles um, as well as hybrids. So, the community are actually quite happy seeing more and more EV vehicles coming to the peninsula and using the spots um, and even the local businesses are really pleased to see that it has been well utilised. Um, improves access for three dedicated spaces for EV vehicles um, and as I said it's um, in response to community and also usage um, that's happening. Um, thank you to um, Waka Kotahi um, for, for giving us that graph. Uh, last week we also heard um, regarding the paragliding in the peninsula. Um, at the meeting we heard from Ryan Scarlett of Christchurch Paragliding about commercial paragliding on the peninsula and the rigorous one year long process he completed to obtain commercial licence. Paragliding is low, impact, is low impact to the land, um, walk on, set up, walk off, fly up for about 20 minutes, land, pack up, walk off again. So it's quite interesting to hear how that process works. The board recommended granting commercial hang gliding and paragliding operators, including Christchurch Paragliding, um, Power Pro Limited and Cloud-Based Paragliding New Zealand licences to use the areas as pictured. The last one is domestic tourism on the peninsula is um, going well. Um, Labour weekend saw a very, very busy weekend in Akaroa. Um, visitor numbers have consistently been growing since coming out of lockdown. Um, as I said, huge weekend, Labour weekend. Um, the board has asked that appropriate levels of service continue, and we've had um, more feedback from park staff that that is planned for this coming weekend, being a busy, hot, um, long weekend coming up, so we, we know that Akaroa is going to be busy, and we thank park staff for getting onto that for us. Um, and just the last thing I'd like to bring up that's not on the PowerPoint, um, the official Littleton cruise ship berth opening is on the Wednesday the 25th of November. This is the first purpose-built cruise ship berth in New Zealand. And also the pop-up penguins at the end of the month. Um, starts, yeah, this follows on from the Stand Tall Large Giraffes back in 2014. I look forward to seeing three of the penguins out in the peninsula. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, <coughs> any questions? No. Would you like to move it, James? Oh, you're not. You're not the one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just suddenly went to Coastal Burwood, which is the next, next item one. on the agenda because <laughs> I'd already crossed you off. Sorry, Andrew. Would you like to move it? 
<laughs> Do I have a seconder? I'll second it then. Oh, James, <laughs> <take yours. laughs> I'm going to accept James's offer of seconding the motion. <laughs> Is there any discussion? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Uh, so the next one is White High Coastal Burwood Community Board. Thank you. And we've got Kelly Barber and um, Joe Zervos, who's the deputy chair, and uh, Chris Bullock Taylor. Awesome. Thank you. In the middle, no, Kelly. You can talk. Turn out her fight. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, um, so I don't think you've uh, met Jo Zervos before. She's the deputy chair uh, of our board, and of course you know uh, Chris Turner extraordinaire. Anyway, so um, yeah, so uh, this is a bit of a momentous day for um, the South Shore and uh, South New Brighton communities uh, as the earthquake legacy project comes before you, and uh, we really look forward to your consideration of that. I just wanted to highlight that before we start. So. Um, Community board decisions under de delegation, uh, Spenceville Residents Association and PEEP uh, have been before us, and um, also 22 recipients uh, for Summer with Your Neighbours, a, a very popular program uh, in the area, so they've um, all just been passed recently. Uh, moving on to uh, Thompson's Park Mural, uh, so the North Beach Residents Association completed a mural on the old toilet block. Um, and New Brighton is full of uh, wonderful murals, actually, if you ever care to take a walk down there and have a look at them. Um, they certainly brighten the place up. Right, moving along. Eastern Community Sports and Recreation. Um, so we embarked on a unique undertaking um, in Rafiti Domain. And um, the, if you don't know and you haven't been down there, they've... Uh, uh, built a massive canopy um, over uh, what essentially was um, will transform underutilised and run down tennis and netball courts um, with this all weather multi purpose uh, sports and um, recreation asset. I don't know whether you've been there, but it's an absolutely fantastic uh, looking facility. I think it's going to be great. We actually had the Prime Minister come uh, to New Brighton uh, as a guest of uh, local MP Puto Williams. Uh, on the 24th of September. Um, it was uh, one of uh, s sort of seven local projects that received a total of $7 million as part of the government's shovel-ready funding. Uh, City Council paid, played a role too. We actually contributed through the uh, Capital Endowment Fund, 172000 towards this. Uh, it's going to be an absolutely fantastic resource for the community. And um, yeah, you'll note in the photo to the left of the Prime Minister is a Local security managed to um, corner those two fellas and just kind of keep them back there. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure whether they were handcuffed or not, but um, anyway, it was it was great to see them there. <laughs> it should be. So moving right along. Um, so the New Brighton Spring Gala uh, was held um, on a beautiful spring day in New Brighton, uh, community board funded. So that was Saturday, 26th of September. Um, you know, at the Seaside Market uh, again. Get down there on a Saturday if you've got nothing to do. It's a it's a wonderful environment, a beautiful place, uh, and they're there pretty much every Saturday. Right, move along. Thank you. So the New Brighton um, Men's Shed also had their official opening. Um, this is a really interesting organisation. Uh, it's a trust. The New Brighton version was established in 2009, and they were sort of virtual for four years until they found their first um, sort of facility at St Faith's in Hawk Street. Uh, I think that was opened by the illustrious MP at the time, um, Ms Leanne Dalzell. Mm -hmm. um, and then in December 2019, they um, moved to St Andrew's Church, and they're in a bigger premises there. Uh, the council would, uh, or the community board has recently funded extraction for um, uh, fans for the dust that they produce in their projects. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing, uh, primarily men, but it's open to anybody who wants to do uh, individual projects or community projects. Um, just the sort of thing that, uh, that we're really pleased to be involved with. And last but not least, uh, I don't know whether you saw the news, uh, recently Breakfast TV um, made a bit of a fuss about the Bottle Lake Forest relocation of hundreds of fairy houses, which seem to spring up from nowhere. Um, the beauty of this is um, one of our local um, rangers was actually involved in explaining uh, the relocation, 
And we've got our, um, Chris Turner, Ford Coppola, Spielberg is going to wrangle a bit of a video and just show you uh, a wonderful advertisement for our area and uh, for our council staff. So it's just a, a short clip from it, but the link is in, in your report. So fingers crossed it We're work. shifting them to a, a, a safer environment, oh. basically. And they're, they're quite... Hip. One moment. There we go. Play. Be about the shift. And let's rewind the clocks back a little bit to, to lockdown because this uh, this community was here before lockdown, but then they numbered in the tens, didn't they? They, they were, they, to be honest, the ferrets have been in the forest the whole time, I've known this, and, and they, they must, must have had a premonition and they started revealing themselves before COVID, but once COVID <laughs> occurred and we were in lockdown, they, they let themselves be known. And, you know, they just got such a vibe out of the people coming in here and lifting the spirits at a time when people needed their spirits lifting. And even though they are moving because uh, all of these trees are being taken down for logging, uh, they are going to be uh, replanted, aren't they? Yeah, this is, this is a sustainable forest and it's going to be replanted as soon as it gets, um, they, get, they get milled, yeah. So it's, it's a part, part of the process. Fantastic. And uh, just one last question. Have you seen any strange occurrences from the fairies around here? Well, funnily enough, yeah, there's been some complaints from serious uh, joggers who have been breaking into spontaneous dance because of the... Can you smell that? I think I can. It's no, a bit of a... I can smell fairy dust. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to have to throw back to you guys because this fairy dust has just got us. So that actually went on for <clears throat> what seemed... That actually, that dance went on for what seemed much more than a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> uh, but I thought it was a great advertisement for our council staff and, and for the whole project, so, yeah. I don't think the presenters wanted to take the camera away no. from them. <laughs> that was well done. Yeah, no, it's fabulous. So, so that's th all. Th thank that's you for thank ending you. on that note. Have we got any questions for the um, Aaron? I, I, yeah, I don't want to state the obvious, but with your men shed not having a home for four years, prior to that, were they just New Brighton men? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I can answer that, actually, uh, Aaron. I would say so. Just yeah, checking. Yeah. <laughs> Phil, did you want to say Are something you one about of your them, shed? Phil? Oh, I thought you were going to say something, Mitch. No, I'm going. Uh, James has already moved it. Yeah, because I invited. Yeah, but but you can get to second it, <laughs> James. My question is: um, Are you aware that photo of uh, the Prime Minister and me and Phil standing behind you? <laughs> are you aware that Phil was there because he was part of the? Waiata Totoko, that is, he sang the song that um, at the end of her speech, didn't you, Phil? He mined it very well. Yeah. Could you sing it now? <laughs> James, it was quite funny. James said, I said, where we go? He said, follow me, bro. We walked in, we here we are planted right behind the Prime Minister, looking looking quite important, weren't we? It was good. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's true. Um, he did sing to I did, I did, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so on. Very good. Um, all right, so it's been moved and seconded, James and Phil. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Big day Thank for you. South Brighton. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the next one. Well, I'm... I'm um, um. <laughs> I've got another. Well, can, we'll have the Waimairo Fendleton Waimairo here with community board because that that won't take very long, and um, then we'll have a short break. <laughs> well, just, just, just I'm just, just I'm just guessing that it's not going to take a long time. Well, no, it, I'm sort of you thinking seven slides, I didn't ten notice, seconds a slide. I didn't here notice any controversial items on on, on no, your agenda. No, but anyway, no, I'll no, hand no over humor, to you. Um, no videos either. I'm sorry. Um, so thank you very much Can for uh, having us on. We'll wait for the... You see, council is yeah. a, a, a desperate for coffee and that's fine. things I like that. That's fine, I appreciate that. It's um, half an hour late that's for the great. coffee well, break, well, That's but... probably a good place to start. Here we are with the uh, um, Kapitoi 
to a uh, dwelling opening which had just happened last Monday. Um, you'll see the centre photo there with Aaron Kewen, uh, with a gentleman who lived in the house, uh, so this is along the main north road, lived in the house in 1941 40, or 42, 40, something like or, or early 40s. However, the, the photographer didn't quite capture the person that walked in before him, who was a lady who was a resident in the house in 1931. Uh, um, so... Uh, and still a local resident in, in the neighbourhood. So amazing to sort of see them there at the official opening. Mm. Um, so that, you know, that building has obviously got quite a few stories to tell. So uh, it, was, um, it was a fantastic. Now, obviously, a, a number of you might know the face of the lady uh, top right serving the scones and the, uh, the cups of tea. So that's uh, Margaret from our community board, who is um, the part, one of the team. So I'm not quite sure where she got the apron from. Um, some had <laughs> suggested maybe the, the place along John's or Ryan's. Uh, was it Rusty or Ryan? <laughs> um, for those of you who know the issue on that street. Um, oh, so that's just us uh, in the window. Um, yeah, so the photographer was looking for a, a, just a different shot. And the window is uh, Yeah, and I believe the window might still be broken. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah. Um, walk and talk. So obviously, oh no, sorry, um, uh, Bishop Dole Green. So this is um, a uh, project which, which, which has taken quite a bit of community um, involvement recently. Uh, the, the murals on the wall being painted by various people, uh, the, the, the chessboard and the furniture all being done actually interestingly with involvement from our local uh, men's shed people. Um, so it's just great to sort of see it continuing to come along. Um, obviously the trees and the plantings and the landscaping um, will beautify that area over time. So but actually, actually one little wee thing just to notice up there just since I do have the time. Um, the Bishop Dale, under, on, the, on the wall you can sort of see the word Bishop Dale and there's a, a, a Kia there. So that's actually one of those Instagram type photo um, places where you can sort of stand, um, have your photo taken and it appears that if you have wings or a, um, in behind the back of you. So that's, that's quite popular with a lot of the local kids um, sort of uh, doing their photo bombing there. <laughs> Uh, next one, obviously, walk and talk to a um, local community group um, uh, out and about walking. Uh, they were guests at Monavale, uh, which was exciting. Um, but uh, great to see a number of our older residents out and about enjoying the um, uh, almost here summer. Um, and in, it, this isn't quite as large as our combined event with um, our neighbours at uh, Hornby Hall to Rickerton, but with the likes of culture galore, but Celebrate Bishopdale is a very large community um, activity in our ward. Um, it attracts uh, thousands of people, it, it takes quite a bit of staff time to organise, um, which they do fantastically. Um, it's just coming up um, on the 22nd of November, um, and everybody's invited to come along. Um, one of the popular, uh, there were lots and lots of popular stall holders and activities, so it's a, it's a great morning out, or great, great day out for everybody. Um, last but not least, uh, something for Aaron. Um, uh, this was a photo taken, uh, I think it's uh, the top 100 crashes that you don't have when you don't have a top 100 crashes or intersections. Uh, um, so, yeah, I think this, the photo says it all. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to answer Thank any you. questions. Any questions? Happy to move. Moved by Sam, seconded by James. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Thank Let's you very carry. much for your time. Enjoy Thank your you coffee. very much. All right, we'll stop for a break. It's 11.22. So um, what do you think, Joe? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, um, 11.35. 11.35, be back here then. Thank you.
time. Cheers, everyone. Thanks very much. Um, could I invite the Waipuna, Horsville, Hornby, Rickerton Community Board um, representatives, Mike Mora, here, and Matt, Matt Pratt. Morning, Leanne, councillors. Thanks very much for the opportunity to present our board report. Um, we have got one part A, but anyway, we'll go through um, our decisions on the delegation and just just flagging um, the um, the John Patterson Drive Richmond Ave intersection that's been causing a little bit of an issue in our area, um, and we asked for a safety report to be done on that, an independent safety audit. We've got that, so um, we're uh, comfortable with moving on with that. But just wanted to point out that the um, the road is still the intersection is still under the control of NZTA. So we want to make sure that the um, all that work done prior to um, it becoming a city council road. And then moving on to, um, to other um, things that we approved on the 13th of October, uh, the Peace Rock and the, its location at Harrington Park um, was, um, was quite um, a good thing to, to see happening. And the other really is um, um, just no stopping, etc. Which we, well, I think, all boards have got quite a lot of um, work happening in that area. The part A is the said coming to the but other significant projects in our board area is the is the um, Hornby Centre concept and design, and um, I understand that that's um, that's moving now, virtually to um, to um, leading the contracts. So really, really pleased to see that happening. Other significant events community in our area, um, Ricketon on the Roll, the expo that we had there, that was very, very good. The groups come along and talk to us about um, what they're wanting to do in, um, in Ricketon. And we've also um, got the... Um, yes, the... Um, the event that we had in um, in Rickerton at the Clarence Street next to our uh, new um, library and service centre, and that was a very successful day where we um, borrowed that area off the mall. So um, and that was a successful day. And the um, as you can see, um, the showcase. Facilities and, um, and activities in Harrington Park, Parara Reserve, the best start racket, and be, you know, those sort of events are, are really, really popular. And just before we go on to community service awards, um, I just want to mention that the um, there's a family fun day coming up as well in Hallswell on Saturday, the 12th of December, at the TR Pearl Hallswell. And it's Christmas crafts and pool passes and stuff to give away, and it's from ten to twelve on um, on um, that that Saturday fun day. So just something to look forward to. But the community service and youth awards was a was a a really good function, and I'd just like to um, to point out um, one there, um, the lady in the middle, on the front row. Um, second from the middle on the left hand side no, um, Nola Moffat now um, these girls, the twins Nola and Nova came from Reefton to Christchurch um, at the age of 14 and started organising things in the, in the Hornby High High area they were organising um, dances to raise money for Plunkett they were um, foundation um, committee members on the High High um, and kindergarten. They also um, were fundraising for um, for Hornby Hornby Primary School and involved in that. They were also involved in the PTA of um, of um, um, Branston Intermediate, and were really pushing and pushing and pushing to get Hornby High School. And um, back in the day, in the 19, 1975. So you know those two gems, identical twins have done so much for our area and it was just sad to know that um, one of the Nova 
um, has passed away, but um, but Nola is still um, around and, and passionate for everything that goes on in the area. So I just sort of make a special mention to them. But it was a lovely event, and our city our community board staff done a great job of organising that. So um, that was um, that's that. And um, we also had the spring uh, skate jam in Hallsville as well. Um, Summer with their neighbours is coming up, and. I just want um, South West um, Community Board matters of interest, nothing to report, but I just wanted to report um, our pleasure with the South West Leisure Centre um, and um, what's happening there. And I just also wanted to stress um, um, the importance of the matter that's coming up about the Tihapua Hallswell pool hours coming up later in the meeting. So that's, um, that's really it from, from us. Thank you. Are there any questions, uh, Yani? Yeah, that bicycle event looks really good. Is that a, a hoop that you guys own, or that council owns, and can be moved around, or is that something that you've rented? It's a flexible hoop, and it's a mobile hoop. Community development trust. Oh, I got it from the Community Development Trust. Oh, I borrowed it from a local, a local youth organisation. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, well done. I there just was another thing. Sorry, I forgot to mention was Elizabeth Street um, Street Party that was um, held. Yeah, yeah, just two weeks ago, it was really, really well attended event. So that wasn't mentioned in our um, community activities. So yeah, long-standing classic, the Elizabeth Street Street Party. Oh, yes. You'd like to move, Jimmy? Yes. Is there a seconder for that um, motion? Anne Galloway. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next one is the Waikura um, Linwood Central Heathcote Community Board, Alexandra Davids, uh, with Matt McClintock. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you to Matt for being my clicker. I appreciate it. Um, click away. Um, as you are all aware, we held our by-election recently um, to the community board. And on the 2nd of November, Sunita was sworn in and we are all looking forward to her input to both the board and our communities. So saying a massive congratulations to her and it's great to finally have a full board again. Um, we had community board meetings held on the 16th of September, 28th of September and the 14th of October and some decisions made under delegation were granting a lease to the Mount Pleasant Pottery Group to the Red Cliffs Community Building. Um, it'll be fantastic having them finally back in the area. Um, the board voted for Sui Allen. Um, and she received a YDF grant of $200 towards competing in the Rimbunan Kendo Taikai Championship in Wellington. Um, and the board have also granted the Christchurch Collective for the Homeless um, a discretionary response fund of $5,000 towards the development and implementation of policies and procedures. They are continuing their valued work and helping our most vulnerable in the city. And we thank them so much for that. Um, we wanted to start a discussion around uh, digital exclusion in council consultations. Um, we don't, we're not saying that this happens all of the time, um, but we had Elizabeth Graham um, she came to the board and presented at public forum on, again, the 2nd of November regarding her experience submitting to the draft tree policy. Uh, there is an ongoing participation issue for those who are not online. We would like to see timely information shared in libraries for those in our communities that do not have access to or the ability to use digital copies of public consultations. Um, for the 
Okay, so the board has been advocating on behalf of the Wollstone community regarding the installation of a green right turn arrow to NZTA for the Ferry Road Rutherford Street right turn. We agreed to send a letter to the New Zealand Transport Authority safety team advocating that a green right turn arrow be installed to enable motorists to turn from Ferry Road travelling from the city into Rutherford Street safely. We have a lot of elderly people in the area and at certain times of the day it becomes near impossible and very dangerous for people trying to make the turn. We are still waiting for a response from NZTA, but are hoping after many staff follow-ups, this is not far off. Um, here are some photos of the future Sumner and Hero Awards and the community farewell to Ruth Dyson on the 20th of October. The event acknowledged individuals, groups and businesses who have made significant contribution to the Sumner community within the past 12 months. All award nominees met the Sumner Community Residents Association mission statement of helping to make Sumner a flourishing community that empowers and connects people and place. Um, and the Canterbury Refugee Resettlement and Resource Centre, based in Phillips Town um, Community Hub, has a small community garden right next to the hub's own vegetable garden, which welcomes families to come and learn about growing food and gardening. The number of volunteers is steadily growing as families go down to meet others from their home countries and those who are also going through the stressful process of adapting to a new country and society. Um, and this is another fantastic initiative bringing our diverse communities together through education and sustainable practices. Um, on Saturday the 7th of November, the Charleston Neighbourhood Association celebrated their 40th anniversary. Um, John and Jenny Hoskin have been involved since its establishment and continue to serve their community today. They were awarded certificates and appreciation on behalf of the board. This is a small neighbourhood association, but they have a lot of energy, passion and time for their community. And we're lucky to have them continually pushing issues and taking action in a positive way alongside the board and council. And this is our last slide. Um, Doug Old Wilson briefed the community board on the fabulous work being done by the Friends of Laura Kent Reserve Group and shared their aspirations to have an eel feeding station on the bank of the Apawaho Heathcote River. The board has asked staff to look into the opportunity of strong of storing timber from the Opawa Rail Bridge until such time as it can be used to create the steps. In just over three years, they have planted over 1,500 natives and made the area a far more safe and well-used corridor for the community. This has been a great example of a working group working collectively and collaboratively and effectively with council, and we really appreciate their commitment to the area. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Yanni, you wanted to um, speak to this. Sorry? <coughs> Did anyone have any questions? Right, Yanni. Oh, cool. Um, I was just going to ask if staff could just play a short video on the ferry road. It's only 30 seconds. Um, just to highlight the danger. Um, so this is... Oh, that's okay. Do you want me to talk first and we'll just shot at the end? Might be better. Yeah. So I was just going to move a, a, an additional resolution that the council support the community board's advocacy to NZTA for the right turning arrow. Um, and that really, I've given um, councillors a timeline. This was first raised in a deputation on the 8th of July. Um, the board felt that it was urgent advice needed because of the health and safety issues with the red light uh, running, but also the fact that this site is a road work site as well. Um, and there's a lot of queuing now that was happening because of the roadworks. Uh, 31st of August, the board still hadn't heard, so 
uh, wrote to the Chief Executive of the Council. Um, that letter was sent on the 8th of October. On the 14th of October, we had a public excluded briefing um, where we were advised that it wasn't actually Council's responsibility, it was NZTA's responsibility. Um, it was good. We did have a lot of information at that PX briefing, um, and the Board agreed to send a letter to the NZTA requesting um, and advocating that a green right turn arrow be installed. But on the 11th of November, um, and this is when this video was taken, we've still had no response from NZTA. So I'd hope that the Council would help the Board advocate for it. It's a really dangerous intersection, and it's frightening to see the number of people that are just continually going through the red light. Um, I just wanted to give you two other quick um, points in regards to the Board's agenda. Just to say that the last image that you saw of that reserve, huge community volunteer planting engagement on a regular basis, the other side has a bit of a gap. It is one of the master plan projects that was going to have a footbridge, but actually for a small amount of money we could get something similar on the other side, and that was what I was talking to the other day when we were talking about some of the master plan projects. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. And then the final thing I just wanted to highlight is, um, with this intersection, the deputation that was made in the public agenda was unable to attend the briefing because we've been told that there's a directive that briefings are public excluded and the community isn't able to attend. And it seemed to me in the board's report this month to council, there's two items where people have come in public and raised the concerns, and then we've had public excluded briefings where they're not being able to come and hear what the staff uh, are saying. And I think we do need to think about that, so I'm probably going to raise that in the um, Ombudsman's report back that we've got coming up um, later today, because it does seem to me a shame that when we've got the really good information from staff that the community who have made the deputation are unable to hear it directly. But um, I would welcome the support for this, and I'll let you play the video. Thank you. Um, we've got works. some... Oh, right. And add kids, that's what Hornby did. Yeah, uh, Tim. It seems a lot of letter writing, etc. Would it be an idea to get CTOC, NZTA, and council staff to a meeting with the board in one go? That would be the logical thing for me. To that, that I mean, we, we get really good in buy now with the NZTA with our board, which is fantastic, and we've got a really positive. Um, <coughs> communication now with our staff, NZTA, and so that, that's just that's saved a million things. So On the 14th of October, we didn't have the community there, but we did have council staff and NZTA. And so, CTOC? That, um, they, I they think CTOC were there, well. I'm not sure who the exact, I, I'm pretty sure CTOC, the chair might be able to answer that, but with CTOC, I think CTOC, we had some people there from different operations in council and NZTA, so. Mike. How many crashes have there been at that intersection? Um, I'm, I'm not, we've got a lot of information that we can we can send through, but it's more the risk, like the deputation. I'll let, I mean, the chair yeah, can talk. I don't right. believe the there has been a lot of crashes it. there. Um, so obviously, when we have had previous advice back, um, there was information that came through that there weren't a lot of crashes there. Um, but I think it's more with when you look at the demographics of those communities, you just see people waiting, 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 and I think everybody is aware that it's a dangerous intersection. So everybody's taking their time, but actually, it is a huge risk especially for the people living in that area. Thanks, Alex. Mm. Well, um, we've got some words here which is around supporting the community board's advocacy to Waka Kotahi New Zealand Transport Agency for a right-turning arrow at Ferry Road, Rutherford Street intersection. It is uh, always challenging when, when a local road crosses uh, um, an NZTA road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if we're going straight to the solution, though, which perhaps we should be advocating for them to investigate 
the intersection because we can't just assume that it needs a right turning arrow and there's sometimes reasons why they don't put them in but and it may well be a right turning arrow but I don't think we should be going straight to the solution that's just my view yeah that, that they don't as I understand it they it wouldn't be them that puts it in is that right them being NZTA. NZTA because the right turning arrow you want on Ferry Road not yes. on the state highway but you need their permission have I got yes. that right yes I think so that's um, and the community board has had a traffic assessment on a right turning lane there mm -hmm. and so I don't know how much we can disclose I mean there's a whole report in PX and that support that essentially it supports a right turning arrow so um, I, I think this is all we can do at the moment is to, is to, um, to, 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 to lend our weight to the community board's consideration of yeah. this. So we are obviously waiting for that letter to come back and we are hoping to get that back today. Right. Um, but we're still waiting. But um, we, th we did have a really positive meeting with them, so I'm hoping that we come to a conclusion that's best for that community. Okay, well, we'll, we'll wait for a... For a day, we won't send it today. We'll send it tomorrow. If it... I mean, there's the two issues. There's the issue with the roadworks, which is creating a bit of an, a bit of a problem, uh, and then there Sorry, is the. This is a separate thing. issue, is it? No, no, it's the same. It's the same piece of road, but while they've got. How does the right turning arrow solve that? Because what they've done is they've they've put road cones and shortened some of the queuing distance to make the because right. Because there are temporary roadworks happening yeah, at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so there, in the past, different issues. there's been arrows put in Mike? for roadworks. So I, I sort of just missed the response to the um, that s staff actually supported a, a right turn and arrow in the PX item. I just didn't actually hear. I don't know. I am not sure of the actual support for that yeah. green I, arrow. Yeah, I'm just a bit hesitant of giving our I? support of actually having full information. No, no, look, I, I think that, um, I mean, the, the, what the community board are looking for is some support from the wider council mm. to, to, to get action on this intersection. So let's, let's maybe, if we again take up Pauline's point and Mike's point, really, of not going to the solution, but actually just say that um, support the community board's advocacy to Waka. Um, for, improved for, for, um, for improved safety outcomes yeah. at and risk reduction at, or and risk reduction that's a good good wording yeah. improved safety outcomes and good, and risk reduction at ferry road rutherford street intersection and then that doesn't that close off if they say no to the green light to, yep. to the to the arrow then um if they don't give a green light to a red light i mean do <laughs> green light to a green arrow no. then um <laughs> then uh, it gives us some further options to be working with them on, on the corner. That's great. Thank you so much. Good. All right. No, I, I'd rather not. Well, I mean, you can send it to whoever you like, but don't send it to me because there, there's no point at this stage. You could actually send it to Mike and have a, a discussion with him as the chair of the committee if that would be useful. It probably would be because he sits on most of the regional, well, he sits on the regional um, one as well. All right, so, um, Yanni, you'd like to move this? Yes. And seconded by Jake. I will put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and uh, Waipapa Papanui and his community board... Emma Norris and Simon Britton, welcome. Kia ora koutou. thanks for having us along today. Um, we are going to take our report as read and we'll just highlight a few things from it. Mm -hmm. um, first up, we have a picture there of some stu school strike for climate um, students who have been doing a number of planting days along the Styx River. Um, they did one in September where a bunch of them caught the bus from town out to Lower Sticks Road, um, planted 500 plants and then bust back into town. So that's some great work that they're doing out there. 
Um, we will just touch briefly on the Part A that we've got coming to you today. Um, obviously, you've heard those deputations this morning. Um, we made our decision based on the information that we had in front of us and that we heard from the community at the meeting that we had. Um, if we had heard those deputations that you have heard today, our, dis our recommendation may have been different. Um, obviously, we can't say that definitively, but there's a possibility. So I just wanted to put that out there. Simon, did you have anything else to add about that? Uh, just the other comment I'd make is that the people that made deputations today have had the benefit of about a month to read and consider the report on the options. Uh, when members of the community came and spoke to the board, they'd had about two days because it was released to the public with the agenda for our meeting. Uh, and I think that needs to be considered as well in terms of uh, the ability of people to really digest a, a complex issue and speak to it at such short notice. Yep. Uh, we, in October, we as a board had a site visit to the um, new St Albans Community Centre, which is nearing completion. Uh, it was really great to um, get in there and see the inside. It's looking absolutely amazing for the wood, and wood finish. That on the left hand side there, that's the main <coughs> hall area. Um, and then the right hand picture there, that's one of the, that's the biggest meeting room at the front of the building on the Colombo Street end. Um, so that is um, on track to be finished at the end of February. So we're looking forward to uh, the beginning of March when we'll be celebrating its opening. So the work on transport projects in the St Albans Edgeware Mighty Hill area is coming to an end. Uh, as we discussed at this meeting last month, uh, there's, a, I guess, a, a sense of relief for the road cones to be going away. Uh, so this is the work to implement the downstream effects management plan that's already been touched on today. Uh, there's very little work to be done now to complete that. Uh, and, yeah, the sense is and the, it's good for the community for that work to be done. I th I, I'm sensing a, a bit of a, a weariness from that community for the, because of the impacts of that work and, of course, uh, what's coming next next month when the CNC is due to open will be the, the increase in traffic that's associated with it. However, the, the roading work that was needed to be put in place is now ready, so that has um, worked out well in terms of the timing of the order of those events. Um, this here is a picture of the, the back wall of the Marahou Volunteer Library. Um, we used some funds from our discretionary our response fund to um, get this mural done. Um, and the locals are really impressed with it and it looks really great. So it's good to see that. A living wall has been installed on the side of the Graham Condon Recreation and Sports Centre in Papua Nui. It's on Sisson Drive, just by the main entrance. Uh, so that gives a, 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 an organic alternative to a, a typical you know, treatment of, of an external area wall, functional wall of a building. Uh, and it's you know, looking really nice as you move through that area. And then finally, um, we every term have a meeting with the principals from the schools from our area. Um, we had it a couple of weeks ago and we had we always have a guest speaker along um, to speak about something that's relevant to the schools and the principals. Um, this time we had Jono and Jade from Te Uraho, which is a um, community group in Papua Nui with a focus on youth and community development. And they also run the um, school attendance service uh, for the wider Canterbury area. So it was great to have them along talking about uh, the programs that they offer and the assistance that they can give schools. And that picture up the top there is their nearly completed development on their site on Windermere Road. It's looking absolutely fantastic and it's a great um, asset for the community. And that's us. Excellent. Uh, Pauline. Um, I've got a question on the green wall which I, I didn't know about until I saw it in the report. So where did that come from? Is that uh, just a council initiative, putting it on the, our facility? I believe that came just through staff. It yeah. didn't come to us. Yeah, no, yeah. no. And so obviously it'll look, look a lot better when it's got, um, when the plants have grown. That's an early photo. Yeah, yeah it looks yeah. more established today. But I mean, that, that is people. what I thought we were going to get far more of in the central city. Yeah. Green walls and green gardens. and um, oh, We're, we're a leading board pulling. Yes, we are. I was going to say that. We are. It's great to see. No, thank you. And I love the mural on the gorgeous little Māori Ho Volunteer Library. And, and it's just given the community there such a boost. You know, it's a lovely little library, that one. So thank you. I'd like to move it when it's ready. Very good. Um, Anne? Um, thank you. I've just um, noticed that, uh, 8.2 and the uh, Papanui Bottolo liquor store 
situation? That, that um, application has been withdrawn. Has it? Yes. Great news. That's yes. very good. Okay, thank you. Good. Uh, we don't know the reason, but we would hope so. I guess, sorry, I guess that, um, you know, it's an opportunity to, to highlight again the fact that community boards often have to pick this up and fight, and uh, I don't think it's um, just, really. So I think we need, as council, to really consider what we do in terms of um, uh, an, a lap and um, getting some control over this sort of situation. Um, just my question is just in relation to your opening comments on Cranford Street. Um, and I know we're going to deal with it later on, um, but the, uh, the, but I, I didn't really appreciate because what I was surprised at were the significant um, deputations. You know, I mean, significance as in uh, you know the mayor of Waimakariri and NZTA and ECAN, um, who weren't aware. And I just wonder whether that just being on the community board agenda with, as you said, a two days notice to your own community wasn't reflected in what we heard this morning as well. And, I mean, would you favour us actually deferring the decision today um, or and, and then working very hard on getting a, a resolution so that it could be timed in conjunction? If, you know, if the, if the resolution was to go for a, um, a, a, a PT lane, um, you know, obviously we're going to have to take advice on what NZTA said this morning, um, but also the commitment that, that I've personally made to the to public transport sitting on the Greater Christchurch Partnership and, and knowing the investment that has been made by Waimakariri and not just uh, financial capital but political capital for the council voting for that amount of resource to go into the park and ride, and knowing that the express bus service has been signed off by ECAN, and the um, increase in the uh, frequency as part of the um, that wider uh, business case around the future future transport future future pub, public transport futures whatever it's called, yeah. So, I mean, what, what, what's your take on that? Because I sense that there's, we've got to come to a resolution, um, but I'm deeply concerned about where it sits at the moment. I don't see any point in delaying the decision. I think you've heard what you heard this morning, and I think you've right. got what you need to. OK. Yeah. No, well, I, I felt I should ask, so, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, Mike. Um, I guess the question would be, if the council decided to do uh, peak time bus only lanes, would you, do you think the community board would be disappointed? I don't think so. Um, obviously you've had more information and heard more than what we did when we made our recommendation and like I said, our recommendation may have been different if we had that information. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. It's um, you know always difficult when there are competing interests in these corridor issues, but um, thank you. Um, okay, Bjarni? We'd just like to thank you for the um, Edible Garden Awards and the Meeting with School Principals. Oh. Our board's doing that now as well. Yeah. Everything yeah. good starts in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, we heard that. I, was, I meant to thank Spread and Cashmere, but then I understand it came from you, so oh. thank you. I, I started there too. I lived there. There you go. <laughs> I lived there when I was a little girl. <laughs> Right, so um, that would like to be moved by Pauline and seconded by Mike. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And um, we're deferring the decision on Cranford Street until later in the afternoon. Um, and we'll move to Te Hapua um, summer, summer pool opening hours. Um, we've heard from the uh, community board uh, would some Anne, would you like to move this? Thank you. And seconded by um, Jimmy Chen. And um, we're asking for um, urgent advice from the chief executive, and we, we the emphasis was on urgent advice in this respect. So, uh, is there any discussion? This is a staff recommendation. 
Yeah. Okay. What? Sorry, I thought you said urgently seeks advice. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry, my misunderstanding, John. Slightly, well, it, it's related. So um, it is, that, um, with Pioneer being closed, could some of the services um, from there then be moved over to, to Harpoor with its lengthened hours if, we, if that goes ahead? Yep, from, from discussions with Nigel Cox, uh, Head of Rack and Sport and Events, uh, the services uh, that would have been uh, undertaken at Pioneer have been dispersed across all of the facilities in the network, and I would imagine that would include to Harpoor as well as everywhere else. Because we've been told that some won't be because of the opening hours not being long enough. Um, so people have to travel across the city and some people don't have cars. So um, if it could be at Tahapua, that would be good. I'll pass that back to Nigel. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And sorry, I just, it would be remiss of me. I meant to ask this earlier, but um, in terms of urgent action, I'm wondering what that looks like just because this, the season starts this weekend and uh, it would be great you know, to understand the time that would be involved in uh, getting this uh, in place. Well, it won't be before this weekend, but... Um... Well, it depends. When I talked to the head of service at some point today. Yeah. Right. Uh... Uh, Leanne, the uh, uh, officers are, uh, are currently preparing the advice to... Uh... Oh, here he is. Sorry. Sorry. That, that, um, sorry, I misunderstood this. I thought support so staff were supporting this recommendation for the chief executive to get us some urgent advice. I seem to have misunderstood. So, um, but now I'm hearing that you are actually already doing this, getting advice, preparing advice. We're preparing advice for the, the to give to the chief executive so she can uh, give the advice back. Uh, my side from the funding side and uh, Nigel from the, the pool operations side. Okay, well that, that's very, very good of you. Excellent. So, um, well, I've got, I've got Yanni and Aaron. Just, um, I mean, when you get the advice back, is it gonna look, because the report's really good, you've got the alternative polls, Waltham and Faranui are actually the closest to Pioneer. Are you, are you gonna look at their extensions of opening hours? No, sorry, I, th I think the point is, you know, we've provided advice back to the community board about our recommendation for the hours and the extension of those. We've already done that in terms of what I think this is in relation to is the use of the discretionary response fund to extend the season and whether that's the delegation that, that the community yes. board has because our recommendation was not to extend the season based on um, the closure of Pioneer in 2018 and 19 and the numbers that used T Harper at that time when Pioneer was closed and then the trial that was there last year as well. I guess one of the concerns in the report, though, is around if Pioneer closes, where do people go? If you're giving advice back on Te Hapua, are you going to look at Waltham and Faranui as... No, that, Yanni, he just answered that question. No, no, I and get what the board he said wants... was the board wants to know if they are delegated to use their DRA for this purpose. Yeah. And that is the advice that is being put together. And I think that we should allow that advice to be um, completed and provided to the board. Is that right? Yes. Yep. That's it's right. Yep. Um, I've got Aaron. Yeah, so I'm just trying to um, work out under 2.6, it says the, um, the $50,000 of funding received from the board contributed directly to the participations at a cost of $13.62 per participation. Mm -hmm. What does it cost to swim at this pool? The actual cost of? $13.62. No, no. Cost yeah. Oh. Yeah, what's, what, what is the subsidy $4. per swim, and does it change much with the extension? It's, so the, the cost to attend a facility in terms is $3.10 for a child and with an adult, or Yeah, that's what the 80. person pays, but then the rate payer chunks that was in the, it. That was the, the subsidy was calculated on based on, I think it was the top of my head, 3,600 and something participations divided yep. by the amount that was spent. That's what it cost per swim. So, of yep. subsidy. so that's our total spend, or that's yep. the additional spend? That's the additional spend. Mm -hmm. So what, what's a swim, what's a swim subsidy now? So the swim subsidy for an outdoor pool is around six dollars, I believe. In terms of that's what we subsidise over the, all the participations. Right. So this was great in that. And this yeah. So this above. extended times over double the normal subsidy cost. Yes. 
Okay, and so our general outdoor pool is how much? Six dollars ish. Around six dollars. And what's an indoor pool now? About two dollars forty. Is it a lot cheaper? Yep. Wow. And that includes the capital cost or just pure OPEX? In terms of to go through and give the detail, I'm pretty sure it's, it's just the pure OPEX. Capital is not included in that cost. Wow, okay. Significant interest, obviously, in this matter. I didn't expect it to no, take so long. No. Could Andrew? Um, thank you, and I'll put this as a question, but is there not already a precedent or an example of the answer to question two, in as much as the Banks Peninsula Community Board did exactly this with regards to the Littleton Summer Pool last summer? That was a... The, uh, I would like to uh, uh, look into that and provide the Chief Executive uh, some advice. I think it would be remiss of me to answer this very pertinent question without actually doing the work and getting my facts right. Yeah, I, 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 I'm kind of going to open it up for debate. So have I got a mover and a seconder for this? I'll move. I've got Anne and Jimmy. Yeah. Yep. All right. I will put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I want to talk today. Okay. Um, the next item is the Audit and Risk Management Committee minutes. Sam, this is the opportunity for you to move them and speak to them if you wish. Um, you don't need to update anyone in the committee. Yeah. Um, Okay, so that's been moved uh, by Sam, seconded by Andrew. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. And I'll move the Christchurch Momentum Committee minutes and just simply record that um, we're restructuring the um, by agreement with uh, the co-chair and, and mm -hmm. others that we will restructure the way this operates and improve uh, the momentum that it's able to <laughs> support. Um, so I'll put that motion. Oh. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. And the next item, uh, the... Um, oh. oh, sorry, I thought we were going straight on to the other minutes. Um, I've got... Right, OK. Um, the the uh, Central City Action Plan um, refresh. Mm. Have we got? Sorry? What's that? Just a bit confused about your central city momentum, whether there were minutes or they're actually just, this is a report to council, wasn't it? Just the, that was just the, um, that was just the, that was just the minutes. We've done that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes, I had a question the about the Central City, City Actions Plan refresh. So there's no there's no presentation on that, is there? No. Okay. Um, well, no, I no, no. Ask well, a question yeah. Or? Okay. Well, I mean, you can move it, but I, I have. Um, I, 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 I personally that, would like us to um, consider. Um, uh, laying this one on the table, um, but John, perhaps if you come forward, that's mm. probably the easiest way. And Brendan, so um, at our meeting, we had a um, sorry, and I, I just haven't opened it. I got sidetracked into thinking that all of our minutes were being dealt with at the same time. At our meeting, we asked that. Uh, that the that the uh, refresh be supported by um, the evaluation report, which is shown as a draft evaluation report, but it's but it's not a draft, is it? No. So um, and the evaluation report that was completed in September for is that right for the October to March period, October 2018 to March 2020. That's correct. Yeah. Right. So when when I read it, what what seemed to be um, missing was uh, what was was the, the the concept of of an action plan 
having set goals and then having different um, actions that would uh, help us measure whether we were um, achieving those goals or not. But these evaluations, uh, this evaluation report, um, seems to talk about achievements as, uh, as yeah, it, it doesn't sort of seem to set goals other than uh, what the agreed action plan focus areas are without any specific goals or, or milestones to achieving those goals. So it just it strikes me that in refreshing the action plan, that's what we really need to do, because when we read the momentum report that was actually written for out of, um, I think it was Regenerate Christchurch, wasn't it? Um, that was really quite uh, focused on what would need to happen in order to meet the, um, you know, the, the sort of the, the you know, meet what, meet what needed to be achieved within the central city. And, and many of the risks that it identified are actually even more uh, concerning today than they were back then. And I know COVID-19 has had an element of an impact in relation to that, but we're just not making the difference that we need to make, both in terms of central city residential and, um, and the other elements of the, of the plan. So, staff agree uh, with you, Leanne, that the, um, uh, the report that we have measures the actions that we said that we'd do under the Central City Action Plan. Uh, and just to remind everyone, the Central City Action Plan uh, was designed as a three-year plan uh, to cover a particularly vulnerable period, um, uh, while some of the major facilities and anchor projects um, uh, were in their final completion phases. So we're coming up to the end of that period over the next year. Um, we have updated the council website and we uh, brought to this the attention of the committee as well. So um, the outcomes that you're talking about are um, reported explicitly on the council website under Central City Insights. So um, there are three theme areas. There's eight outcomes that are measured and there's a wealth of information um, under those outcomes. Um, uh, just in terms of the, how the central city is progressing, um, actually the central city population uh, is increasing. It's increasing faster than the rest of the rest of the city population. So it's up 8.5% um, to the end of October. That's a significant increase. Um, central city spending is up 19%. Then the same period uh, year on year. So that's up until the end of September. Um, so people are spending in the central city. Um, the impact of COVID-19 um, uh, on the Christchurch CBD is far less than any other CBD in the country. So Christchurch has proved more resilient um, in terms of its central city uh, than any other CBD in the country. Uh, and the other one that um, we touch on in the 8011 project is we're on track this year to complete more than 400 homes in the central city which is 100 more than our previous record year, which was last year where we completed about 300 homes. So um, many of the indicators that we are tracking uh, that deliver on the outcomes of um, a thriving economic heart of an international city, a vibrant people-focused place day and night, and growing livable, livable central city neighbourhoods are tracking in the right direction. So that information is, um, and a wealth of other information, um, is publicly available on the Council website. Yeah, I think that I was um, more looking at some of the um, some of the things that we have agreed to do and and whether they are impacting on that or or are these things happening anyway I mean I, I'll use one example and that is uh, the number of um, uh, you know, what what are they called the they they got nicknamed the dirty 30 even though the numbers have reduced we don't actually have uh, a goal of having none, uh, and we don't have measurable steps where we where we have certain actions and processes agreed where they are actually all ticked off the list. You know, so um, th that's what I mean by by the measure of measuring of um, of goals. Writing down that. Uh, the number has 
decreased from 30. Well, the net decrease has been, I can't remember, about nine, I think I read in this. Um, doesn't seem to be targeted to what we need to do to actually fix the problem that we've got. Sure, so um, what I talked about were the three high-level themes, um, and you're talking about a, um, a sub-component within those. Um, it is always difficult to know whether the actions that you're undertaking lead to um, the impact and the outcomes uh, exclusively themselves. So um, we've done the actions, and uh, what I've articulated is the outcomes or the impact uh, heading in the right direction. Um, whether we can um, put it all down to that action, um, no, of course you can't. Um, and on the example that you've provided, um, uh, the majority of those buildings are owned uh, privately. There are a couple that are owned by council. Um, uh, good progress has been made, but we certainly haven't resolved the issue. There's still 21 at least across the city that are barriers to the city's progress. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, well, I, I'm not prepared to shrug. I, I, I'm, I would rather that we um, did some further work on actually establishing some achievable goals and, uh, and monitor those against an action plan that had a set of uh, very specific deliverables rather than the generic phrases of, um, you know, we, we have a commitment to relentlessly pursue residents and visitors. The fact that the numbers are still below the um, amount of residents in the four avenues at the time of the earthquakes doesn't actually indicate the significant amount of progress that we need to make. And, you know, if we need the goal to be a set amount by a certain amount of time and then increase it over time, then, then that, to me, is the appropriate way to go. But I, I'm expressing some frustration with the, with the process of this. Yeah. Jake. Uh, I, I, quite, I think I kind of understand what you mean, um, but I just want a bit of clarity. Are you saying it's not so much in terms of what our staff do, in terms of the, the work program, but more in terms of what we want the city to be and the goals, our goals for the city, and well, uh, kind of separate from the organisation a little bit? There, there's two things. That, one, this has never been about a Christchurch City Council plan. It's about a central city plan, and there are a number of players. But one of the, uh, one of the particular um, approaches is around city leadership, clarifying agency roles and, and collaborate. And uh, the simpl the, apparently we have a sim we've simplified it with a shared voice and more collaboration rationalisation of the range of organisation leading aspects of the city's regeneration has greatly simplified the accountability for progress. But I don't think that's an outcome in its own right. The outcome is whether we're making progress. And in terms of the city's regeneration, I think that we still have got decisions to make around the DCL transition and the role of Christchurch NZ as our economic development agency. So actually focusing on that might actually shift responsibility uh, for the central city action plan, who holds the action plan and then becomes accountable for the measures against which they're held. It might be best held um, by a, a, a co-governance arrangement or by a different arrangement than the one we have now. I'd just rather that instead of just refreshing the central city action plan, actually have a fundamental look at it in terms of achieving the objectives that were set out in the Regenerate Christchurch report. Well, sure, uh, just as a process issue, because I'm conscious this has been through two other bodies before now and it just feels a little unfair. Um, what were you suggesting? Obviously, let this lie on the table. Maybe, I mean, you have a policy advisor who, who works you know, with you specifically. No. Maybe they could work with strategy and I don't. planning. Just to be clear, um, what you articulated there is exactly what we are 
proposing and uh, doing. Remember, the refresh uh, started before COVID-19 and was interrupted um, in terms of uh, its visibility, and it's been now through the working group in the um, uh, committee and now coming to council. So it's um, this, by and large, reflects work uh, that was 99% done prior to COVID has been updated in light of COVID, um, but actually the more fruitful piece of work is the fundamental um, uh, new plan, not the refresh uh, going from year two year to year three, which is um, what we're reporting back on, but the um, uh, fundamentally new plan to reflect that um, with Tapai opening and with the Metro Sports Centre and um, uh, with the Canterbury Multi-Use Arena opening and the other uh, private facilities around the city and uh, the way that the uh, city centre will operate over the next period is fundamentally different to um, the way in the issues that we were trying to solve uh, two and a half years ago when the Central City Action Plan was first put in place. This is for which period? The new piece of work or the piece the of work? The new piece that, of work. Uh, for the period, it needs to pick up for the probably the next three year period uh, through until the opening of the Canterbury Multi Use Arena. Three, four year period. So, so this, this will last until um, the beginning of the 2021 financial year? This, this plan is roughly got an, an 18 month time frame. It's what we can achieve in the next year, year and a mm. half until that subsequent piece of work comes on. It's worth saying that a lot of the action within the action plan, considering the review has been delayed for you know over almost a year now, a lot of the action has been going on regardless, um, you know, continuing to coordinate across partners and everything else. So it is just seeing us through the next 12 to 18 months and all the, all the issues I think you've raised will be picked up in, in that next piece of work. And, it and, and it, to some extent, will pick up on some of the outcomes coming out of Greater Christchurch 2050 and the like. So, and the spatial plan. So, in recommending to council that the refreshed central city action plan be endorsed, um, just why don't we just simply acknowledge or note that the refreshed city central city action plan has been endorsed and that work, I mean, has been completed, and that um, additional work uh, will now be focused on the uh, the next stage action plan, so that it's so that it's because we still have got some major decisions to make as a council in relation to uh, Christchurch NZ, the beyond the transition from DCL uh, and the economic development activities that sit in so um, significantly with um, the decisions that we have yet to make um, about where certain functions will lie and what the role of the council will be and what the role of Christchurch NZ will be in terms of those efforts. So that, so I think if we could just agree to those wording, James. I just want, I don't disagree with anything that you've said, but I, I almost wonder now if what you're proposing isn't actually mutually exclusive to what we've got there. All this stuff is going to be happening anyway. The measurables and the sort of KPIs, for lack of a better word, or what success looks like. I think we're we're both committed to, to refocusing, reshaping this to give it some new impetus and actually give it some momentum which you know it, it hasn't had what we would have liked but we can rectify that I think what we've got in front of us makes a lot of sense it's constantly evolving though any you can turn to any page of it and it's probably um, just a, a bit of a snapshot to a certain extent you know it mentions DCL throughout it that's not necessarily the world now um, talks about AOT gifts well that's on the market that's not happening um, I, I think the principles of it have gone through a pretty good process I, I think staff you me everyone else that's on the committee are pretty well aligned so we can turn our attention to um, trying to focus this down with having some tangible measurables um, offline but I actually kind of lean with Jake with this that we um, that we, we sign it off uh, and then we also do what, what you're suggesting as well which is always going to happen anyway and I completely agree with you and I'm committed to working with you to, to get that done. Well I mean I think you've just highlighted though that the the content of it is is, is not up to date. So That's the nature of it though. If, yes, if, I know, if we send it back to get it up to date it will be out of date again by the time it comes back to us. So. We don't need to update it. We simply note that the refresh has been completed. 
staff have done the refresh. It's sort of semantics. But yeah. They're working on it anyway. Um, and that additional work will be focused um, on the next stage action plan. Right. And that's, that's, that's a statement of what is right. actually and First things first, I'd like to get some momentum on this item, so whatever yes. works then. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Just wondering if this um, is there an opportunity in this to bring into a um, bit of focus this inner city safety. We have the Safer Christchurch strategy, which is kind of hanging at the moment. And I know that Leanne, you wanted to do some work on crafting what that might look like from a local point of view in terms of what we want for safety around safety in the inner city. This I know that it talks about caring for. What does it say? I can't remember the words, but caring for people and, and, and mentioned homelessness. But I'm just wondering, could this be the umbrella to gather that into as well? Yep, I mean, that, that, that's all part of it. Well, I'm, others can speak to it, but it is all part of it as far as I'm aware. Certainly in a rising theme within the central city, that antisocial behaviour, homelessness continues to be an issue that you know, will need to be tackled in the next stage. So, yeah. Yep. Who else? Yanni? Um, I see that one of the actions is reviewing the incentives for development. So when, when is that happening? Because I'm just mindful of the deputation we had this morning. That was on it's a different paper. Just started. A little accuracy in the deputation. Sorry, um, I'll just quote page 159, item number 17, which I believe is this 17. Um, guiding future regeneration, um, agreement of funding opportunities and incentives to support development, a review of existing and alternative incentives is underway. So it is in this paper. I'm just trying to understand when it's happening and what the process is to have a say on that. Yep. That, that issue might be best discussed in the next item which touches directly on this. Okay. Um, and just a final question from me was around the environmental indicators. Do we, do we have any environmental indicators? So when the action plan was established, you, you asked that very yeah. question. Um, we did a lot of investigation at the time, and there was nothing that could be specifically pinned to the central city. There's a lot of data around um, city-wide measuring of, of air quality, water quality, and those sorts of things. I guess environment has really become a perceptual measure um, in terms of livability and those things, which are captured in the central city um, insights. So is there a way that we could track things like, I guess, green building design, um, uptake of certain technologies that were more sustainable than others? I, I guess those are measures. Whether we collect enough of that is a question uh, you posed last time and that yeah. there isn't at the moment. Okay. It's just not being gathered. Yeah. Thank you. So the, it's been um, moved and seconded, so I'll put that motion. All those in favour say just aye. Those opposed yeah. say no. It's carried. What? No. Oh. The next item is the um, is the central city residential program supply and demand. Um, so, do, who who wants to respond to the question that that Yani raised? I thought that we were actually we'd already completed a lot of that work. Oh, uh, you have. Yeah. <laughs> <Thought so. laughs> That's been done, Yani. It's been done in the intervening period from the Central City Action Plan, which is where you were reading from, and that's my point, that um, working through the process, these things quickly come out of date, so you have as a council, reviewed and made your decisions on that. Which is set out in the resolution, yeah. So, um... Sorry, so in the refresh, there's no, there, there was no opportunity to consider it? You, as a council considered the DC rebate in the intervening period. So you've you've considered it and you've made your decisions on it. If you'd like to reconsider it, that would be a matter for uh, the council. Right. Yeah, no, we, we, we've already considered that. Right, so um, I'm happy to move this. Do I have a seconder for it, James? Is there any discussion on it, uh, Yanni? Just uh, part A, I just don't, I don't know that considering reorientating existing council expenditure is really enough clarity. So, I mean, do you want us to actually just to make a call on that? Is there a process for that to be done in terms of reconsidered? Well, the thing is, is that um, to provide the additional resource to the partnership approval service, this is my understanding, um, 
uh, which it's been a highly successful service, hasn't it? I mean, the feedback that I get on it is extraordinarily positive, and it really does help people work their way through the process. Um, they pay for it. I mean, it's a it's a um, it's it's a um, you know, it's resource intensive and it is paid for, but the, every single developer that I know that has mentioned this to me has been nothing Sorry, but yeah, complimentary. I, I, I get that. All I'm trying to understand is, do we need something more explicit that says we're going to stop this service so we can fund this no, one? No, we're going to we're going to ask council to 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 sort this out. That we would like to see existing council expenditure reoriented to mm -hmm. provide additional resource to this. This is. This is good stuff, and the chief executive will provide um, advice to support the council decision. And will that come that. back to us to see what's going to get stopped or changed? Well, it depends whether I have to stop something or not, well, Yanni. Yeah. Until I can look at what that will mean, it may be there may be a method I can use that might not require stopping something. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just mindful of things like the audit, which which got delayed, and then we didn't have budget, and so it got put on hold. Um, I'm mindful of things like yes, earthquake prone buildings, ago. so you know I guess I would I would want to know that we do get an opportunity to see what's proposed to be reorientated before we agree to it. Well, we're, it's quite we're hard to asking agree to something. For the, for, for, we're not increasing the budget, is what mm -hmm. that says. Yeah. Um, what we're asking the chief executive to do is to take on board what our cons our issue is, which is that we're very positively disposed towards this partnership approval service, which is an excellent way of helping developers work their way through the system. All right, so I'll put that motion. I'll just ask you to put it separate and I'll just abstain on that one. Which one? Number. Oh, well, I'll just note that it's an abstention on number one for Yanni. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. Next item, thank you, is um, sorry? the multicultural minutes. Would you like to move those? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but whether I have a chance to highlight, highlight a couple, of, point, a couple yes. of things, just very, very briefly. Absolutely, absolutely, very sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, do I have a seconder for the motion, Pauline? Yeah. Oh. First one, uh, our committee will listen to the Muslim Association of Canterbury. They make a, a presentation to us. Particularly, they appreciate the mayor you know, getting involved with the unveiling of the memorial plaque for the last year most attack. You know. And also, they emphasize uh, the working together with the OEC City Council and some of the key stakeholders. They want to continue working with us. Second, uh, regarding to a multicultural advice group, make a presentation, you know, because it's all uh, the kind of directly, you know, to monitor those advice group. Uh, because uh, the con we, a committee consider, because a uh, council integrate with our key stakeholders, particularly uh, city council, quite ANZ, and some other uh, key stakeholders, regarding to we establish and council approve those COVID-19 recovery plan, but we consider those the, uh, the refugee and migrant groups should be part of this um, umbrella. So we request the staff investigate employment and the training this kind of issue because some of the migrant refugees you know, due to the COVID-19, they lost their job, redundancy, etc. Yeah, that's a key point. Thank you. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded that the minutes be received. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Regulatory performance, Tim Scandra. Um, thank you. Um, just to highlight uh, point eight there, and um, an invitation has been extended to the strategy, strategy and transformation group for a memo, or, or sorry, for a briefing relating to the um, strategic planning and proposals underway relating to King or a programme of social housing development across the city, and it's to provide a map of where it is, et cetera, and the ongoing further development, just for our um, noting and our heads up. So apart from that, it's all very straightforward, and um, I'll move it. Thank you. Seconder? 
on Tim's point. Thanks for raising that. It's sorry, this is just an opportunity for yeah, the... Yeah, I just wanted to clarify something that was in the minutes. I'm sorry, this is just accepting the minutes. There is no discussion on the minutes themselves unless well, you've got a technical It's a very point. technical question. I just wanted to know... No, no, only if, it is, if yeah. it's a typing mistake or it doesn't well, properly reference the decision... It says memo or briefing. I just wanted to check if it's going to be a briefing or a memo. I me. just said it'd be a briefing, yeah. Oh, for goodness sake. Um, seconded by Pauline, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no, that's carried. I mean, I agreed to do this on the basis that it would be an opportunity for things to be raised here that the chairs wanted to raise at the committee, um, not for a discussion. You can talk to the chair of a committee if you want to know the answer to a question like that. Um, amendment to smoke-free public pu places policy. This, we had a deputation on that this morning. Good morning. Um, this hasn't been through a committee, so is, is there anyone who would like to um, move this? Andrew, seconded by Mike. Is there, are there any questions? Yes, Sam? Yeah, just a practical question. I'm just trying to understand. So uh, there was a list of where it would apply. And I'm just thinking, like, somewhere like the terrace, for argument's sake, which is, um, you know, across the road, late at night and things like that, when there's people congregating on the street, uh, would that mean they couldn't vape there, out front? Um, oh. Is there anything? We discourage them to vape. If this, the change of policy will be approved in the council. Microphone. Sorry, can you press your microphone? Oh, sorry, you just press the button there. Yeah. Oh, just press the button. Just press the button. Again. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, um, at present, um, at present, if, um, if the terrace is part of the park, which is part of the park, really, uh, they are only discouraged to, not to smoke. The vaping is not yet being discouraged because we have not included that vaping into our yeah, so to just for, can I just clarify? All of the, the, the um, no smoking parks, etc. Yeah. It's on a, a voluntary or social pressure. Yeah. No, it's no by, by law to ban it or anything. Yeah. So it's oh, yeah. just to, just to, just to clarify that. Yeah, that's yeah. There's, there, there's no material enforcement uh, of the policy, so there's not um, no smoking, no vaping police that go around on the terrace late at night. Or anywhere. Right. So, what's the point in it then? Well, no. Well, it's actually really worked really no, no, well. No, no. Sorry, sports. I was asking. I was, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, eventually, you can um, probably talk about the background, which I think is important if we're going to go back to the fundamentals like that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so I've got Aaron and. Um, Pauline. Aaron, I said, and Pauline. Um, yeah. yeah, so just on number four in the recommendations, um, and I asked the question uh, at our pre-meeting, but request staff investigate extending the policy to other public places, including the central city pedestrian mall areas, beaches and open car park areas, and report back to the uh, appropriate committee in 2021. But I was told that it's already uh, we already have a smoking ban at beaches this morning. Do we or don't we? Because uh, why are we investigating it if we do? The beaches are not part of the smoke-free policy areas. I uh, am smoke-free areas for the current policy. At the current so you're allowed to smoke at the beach at the moment. Yeah. I mean, you shouldn't. I mean, people shouldn't smoke anywhere, but for their own health. But you're allowed to under our policy. Yeah, because it's not a smoke-free area that the council designated. Right. Okay. Okay. But all of these others. So, the only, where would you be allowed to smoke? 
so at your own place and just a regular street? <laughs> again, um, again, our policy is voluntary. Yeah. It's it it was meant to um, change uh, behavior behavior, and it means to um, encourage um, healthy lifestyle. So okay. um, we don't ban smoking, but we encourage people not to smoke in our right. smoke cool. areas. Thank you. So. Um, Sorry, Pauline. Yeah. So my question was also on number four. Um, so what would the investigation involve? Is that uh, going out for consultation? Um, yeah. Um, we've the the proposal then was to um, if the council will agree to that recommendation, um, then uh, we will have discussion with our health partners, potentially for um, uh, working together in terms of. Uh, Consulta consulting the general public and consulting the um, business um, groups as well. So, um, yeah, um, and um, we, we are planning to um, um, use more our um, platforms and um, channels in terms of um, engaging the public on what their views are. Right. I'm just kind of thinking, that is there any urgency around this? Could this not wait for a couple of years? Because we do have an LTP consultation coming up, and that's going to probably... It's up, yeah, again, it's up to the council. Yes, to OK, decide. so you don't see an urgency around that necessarily? No. OK, thank you. Yep. So, sorry, I wasn't here when we adopted the, the last policy around this. I wasn't elected when we did. So just so I'm really clear, if we had a... so we would have a policy in place that we don't enforce and is voluntary. Yeah. That, so even somewhere on, and I'm sorry to hop back to somewhere like the terrace, I'm just thinking of people in the evenings and stuff. So we wouldn't, so they could continue to vape outside, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't do anything about it if someone complained. Or, or if they did, where would we send them? Normally what um, other <laughs> no, I, no, I mean, send them to actually vape. It's a legitimate. It just doesn't make sense that we'd put in yeah. a policy that. Yeah, people. I mean, um, in if you see uh, people smoking or vaping, if it's a smoke-free or vape-free areas, then you can always say, you know, ask them not to smoke or not to vape because this is a designated smoke-free and vape-free areas. I mean, it's really. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. So, um, has the, has the existing policy been an effective tool in terms of reduction of smoking in our parks and various places, especially sports ground and the places where we put up the smoke-free signs? Um, I I cannot personally. I mean. For the, the 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 policy team, um, so maybe we can can I? It's just that we are not uh, into um, implementing. Our team is not implementing it. But uh, I heard from the parks um, if there are um, I mean um, signages uh, signage around um, parks, they always um, uh, respect that. And uh, also, if um, our staff will say that um, if you can, you know, tell them that um, if you can uh, refrain from smoking in this area, then they do as well. And there are also um, effective um, success stories from our workplace. So, um, yeah. It's a map on 275, a graph that shows <laughs> Really big reduction. Yeah. yeah. The council initiatives, smoke free initiatives, is just part of the whole Christchurch. You know, um, we are not the only one implementing smoke free policy, but others too. All right. So, um, so the extension is to the um, to to the existing policy for smoke free for vaping. 
um, and then requests extending the policy to other public areas. But um, in terms of that, uh, in terms of the um, approach, it, it, the question is, is, is there a need to report back to the committee in 2021? I mean, in terms of priority of work, I think that was the question you were asking. Um, as to whether we should be prioritising this uh, right now. Um, Burden, well, the effort people have to make with another consultation at this time. We do have a lot of consultations going on at the moment. Um, so, um, the... This is an indication yeah. I won't be supporting for, but I'll support the rest of it. You could do a consultation. I, I just wonder too. whether whether that could be, um, you know, because I am looking for a, for a way to to kind of um, keep it keep it in play because we do have other partners. You know, we heard our deputation this morning from both the Cancer Society and from the um, from the uh, uh, DHB from the Public Health Unit, and I, I kind of would like uh, at least them to be. Um, given some opportunity to, to, to kind of link in with, with our team in relation to seeking whether there's ways of, of resolving this because the process seems to work very well at the moment. It's not a, it doesn't create an enormous, um, it doesn't create an enormous burden on the, on, on enforcement for, for obvious reasons, but it does give the public the tool to to, to kind of manage, um, you know, a, what is a good outcome? Yeah, social pressure. So, um, so, but, yeah. I mean, I'm 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 happy to put that one separately. But um, I'm just wondering whether we could agree to a, to a to some reviewed wording that might um, address that. Tim. Thank you. Look, it, and it is an oddity, and I totally get what Sam's kind of going with regards to the um, terrace area, because it's very different at a terrace area, and, and the terrace and with bars, etc., and a sports ground where you've got families which in parks, which are kind of peer pressure. So I'm just wondering if four, the complete part of four, is a step too far, and that we look at including only the beaches and car park areas rather than the city mall areas because in the, at the beach you can get the same pressure as you do from sports fields etc but um, and car parks associated with that you may be able to but I do think maybe it's steps and, and it's, it's not logical at all but it's just wondering would that be I know I mean look, the, the thing is is that um, uh, yeah I wasn't aware that this was uh, no was a specific issue and I had um, misunderstood the content of the paper so um, so I was of the view that we were extending vaping to these other areas as well. I'm also extremely aware, extremely aware of the pressure that the organisation is putting on the public in terms of all of the consultations that are going on at the moment. So that's... Twenty twenty one is a long year. Yeah. Yeah. Post um, but anyway, look, I'm 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 open. I've got a I've got a um, a mover and a seconder. So um, so I guess um, I'll d I'll just open it up for debate. Um, if somebody would like to move an amendment to it, well then that might solve the problem. But um, otherwise, I'll I'll take the debate. So does anyone have an amendment to it or? We'll just we'll, okay. We'll, we'll make sure that number four is voted on separately then. Yeah, Andrew. Thank you. Um, I've got a particular interest in this, in as much as I was close to this work in the um, Ched Committee in the 2013 term of council. Um, it's important to note, and it's been um, drawn out in questions, that the policy is voluntary and it only applies to certain areas. But it's also important to note that it does work. Um, bus stops, parks, sports fields probably will be the best examples of where it works. Um, and outside our libraries and in some other areas, it discourages people to smoke in areas where the policy considers this to be inappropriate. And it's through the policy that we make it clear that smoking in those places isn't encouraged and isn't acceptable. And in my view, it's entirely appropriate that we should do that. 
Now, we do have other partners. Um, they presented to us this morning, and we've worked closely with those partners in development of this policy and its amendments over many, many years, and I think it's important that that's acknowledged. So at the time that Council adopted the smoke-free policy in 2009, vaping products were practically unheard of. Mm. They've increased in popularity since then, and it's entirely appropriate that we should now extend the smoke-free policy to also be a vape-free policy. It just brings it up to date with common practice. Um, it's fair to say that um, second-hand vape can create exactly the same annoyance, particularly to non-smokers, as second-hand smoke. We heard about some of the health effects of vaping this morning. Um, it's important that those are also noted. So um, I think um, in terms of updating the policy, this is quite the right thing to do. And I think if vaping had been as popular in 2009 as it is now, the policy would have included vaping anyway. Um, in terms of our leadership role as a council, this is an area where we have shown leadership. Um, I would compare some of the work that Christchurch has done to the work that's been done in Melbourne and Australia, who have also taken a strong lead. Um, and I think we should be continuing to show leadership in this space, extending the policy to include vaping, and considering sooner rather than later how it can be extended um, as appropriate, and that's something we'll consider at that time, so that we continue to like, take a lead in public health, public amenity and respect the work that we're doing with our partners. Um, there was somebody else here, Melanie and Pauline, Aaron. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to say too much. I totally support um, all of these recommendations. Um, it's a no-brainer. I think for number four, um, just in response to Tim, I, I actually thought the opposite. I thought the city mall on a Saturday, the last thing you want with your kids walking around is people smoking. Mm -hmm. And I thought the beach is a better place if people were going to be doing it because it's so big. But I think we should investigate it because that's what it says and then we can look at it properly. So um, fully in support of this whole... Uh, Pauline. Thank you. you. Look, I support including vaping in the policy. I mean, as I agree with Andrew, if it had been around uh, in a big way in 2009, it would have been in. But I don't support four. And the fact is that what we've got now is working, and I think that people are getting the message. We don't have to go around repeatedly adding, adding, adding everywhere that you can't do it. It's actually addressing the principle, hey guys, this is actually not a very social thing to do, not to mention the risk to your own health. So I don't support four. I think we'll just go on and on and on, identifying places as we're going to do that. Let's rely on the principle. And, and looking at these graphs, it is working. So at the moment, I don't think we need to actually do any more work in this area. I I'll, I'll, won't be supporting four, but I'll support the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? Yeah, I'm... Uh it's hugely in favour of the smoke-free policy. I think the smoke-free policy made a lot of sense and is a great example for children uh, in public places to not be exposed to um, uh, smokers or second-hand smoke. I struggle with the vaping one because vaping has been used by uh, a, a lot of people to get away from smoking and the dangers of second-hand vape are incredibly low, if not at all, depending on which report you read. Um, is vaping cool? To some people it is. There's certainly been an uptake uh, by some younger people getting into vaping that had never smoked before, so there is an uptake there. But are those people just going to find a vice anyway? Um, the irony of this is that you're allowed to take a, a, you know, a dozen woodies down to the park and get um, boozed up with your mates, but you're not allowed to have a vape under this policy, which, I don't know, I'd rather people were probably vaping at the park than drinking Woodstocks. And, uh, and the harm of that can be, um, can be quite incredible. Just look at the police stats. I haven't heard of a call out to a vaping incident yet. Um, and uh, then the other one is a few weeks ago, uh, this country almost, almost voted in favour of uh, legalising uh, the smoking of cannabis. So on one hand, you've got just under 50% of the population saying it's OK to smoke cannabis, but the council coming and saying it's not OK to vape. Um, there's a lot of contradictions going on here. Um, so, oh, you can vote your way, Jake. Uh, we know you do that anyway. Um, so, uh, 
To me, this is an overreach. I'm all in favour of the smoke-free policy, uh, not on beaches. If you're going for a lonely walk on the beach, you probably do need a cigarette. So uh, if that's what you're into, if you're depressed, um, feel free to have your vices. But um, vaping, it's an overreach for me. And I just think the recommendations here uh, reinforce our role in, as, as a council leading um, the a com a community to become healthy by reducing smoking uh, prevalence and encouraging people to refrain using tobacco and vaping products. It's a, it's a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned, as Mel said. I think our young people, um, we have to be really aware of the strength of the lobby that's really getting our young people into vaping and we need to just stand against it. So to me, this is just adding to what we're already doing, the great work that we do uh, in this city to, to create a healthy environment. We'll be supporting all, all of the... Sorry, Tim and then James. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, I thought vaping was going to be a really good alternative to cigarettes and, and to, to get the healthy choice, but then when you see them putting in um, nicotine products into it, there's really no point to it. There's just as we have a cigarette. Um, I will not be supporting four for the simple reason that we have put this policy, which does seem idiotic in a sense, but does work, slowly into our areas, into the sports fields, etc., yeah. and that they've been incredibly successful. What I would be worried about is if we went too far and it reversed. I think to go in steps yeah. to then bring into the social um, fabric of our societies um, those families saying that it's not cool to vape around our sports and our kids, etc. Once that's established and it's seen to work, then I think it would be the next steps, whether we go into the beaches and other things. But I, I'm, I would be worried that we went backwards rather than forwards. So I'm, I'm going to vote. I will support everything but for. Uh, James? Yeah, look, I agree that urging people to be smoke-free around the um, uh, edges of sports fields and, and playgrounds has actually worked really well. Of course it's voluntary, but you know what it really comes down to is a bit of common sense and common courtesy. Um, that's been embraced, that's fine, but I also think that people's common sense does apply that to, to vaping too. Um, I'm all for tackling a problem if it exists, but I don't think that uh, the new problem is now rampant playground vaping. Um, it, it's just we're trying to tackle an issue that doesn't exist. And my pet peeve is actually when council tries to involve itself in people's lives to, to levels that are, are just nonsensical. And I do feel that we're starting to get into that territory. So I won't be supporting this. I think what's happening right now is working. And by and large, people possess common sense within our community. Um, as for item four, given that it's been put separately, I also think that makes a lot of sense. That if you want to investigate this, uh, there's a, a large consultation which is occurring. It happens every three years, and it's called the LTP. Um, so I think that's the appropriate place for it. Um, right, um, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Oh, sorry, this is uh, one to five. Excluding four. Excluding four. So um, I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. So can you put up your hands for no? One, two, three, four, five. So that's carried. And do you want them recorded? Okay, James, Pauline, Tim, Aaron, uh, Catherine, and Sam. Yep. Um, and uh, I'll uh, put four. Um, all those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. No. <laughs> um, put up your hands if you are voting yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and no. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right. Well, if I if I voted for it, then it, then it makes no difference. It doesn't go forward. A division. Oh, okay. Just on number four. Councillor McLaren. Ah, yes. Councillor McDonald. No. Councillor Johansson. Yes. Councillor Galloway. Yes. Councillor Daniels. No. Councillor Coker. Councillor Chen? Yes. 
No. Councillor Stendard? No. Councillor Major? No. Councillor Kewan? <coughs> no. Councillor Goff? No. Councillor Davison? Yes. Councillor Cotter? No. Councillor Chu? No. Councillor Turner? Yes. Right, that is um, uh, lost, and I will um, now adjourn the meeting until two o'clock.
Uh, we'll get underway and move on to item number 22, which is the South Shore and South New Brighton Earthquake Legacy Project. And I think staff have got a PowerPoint presentation for us. We've had a deputation on this this morning. Thank you. Um, the report in front of you um, responds to a number of resolutions that were made in August of last year, and staff have been working for the past um, year to, um, to bring this work before you today. Um, this has been work from across the organisation. So in front of you is um, staff representing various units. Um, and we have a PowerPoint presentation to run through and then available to take questions. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm sure everyone's well aware of the lengthy history around the earthquake legacy issues that have affected the South Shore and South New Brighton um, communities and the, I guess, transition of those issue, issue, issues from agency to agency over time. Um, and in May last year, Council um, assumed responsibility for addressing those earthquake le legacy issues in advance of undertaking the Coastal Hazards Adaptation Programme, which is uh, something we discussed yesterday. Um, as the South Shore Residents Association referenced this morning, the communities have been referencing or raising concerns about people's wellbeing um, and the ongoing sense of uncertainty as these issues have taken so long to be resolved. Um, and as mentioned, uh, in May last year, the Council sought um, some responses to those. We engaged with the community between May and August last year. We undertook a community assessment. We got around about 373 responses from the community, and that led to our recommendations last year in August. Um, since August, we have been undertaking some works, so there's been a setback bund um, constructed in the Bridge Street to School area. That's uh, The southern part of that bund has been constructed already, and the northern part will start after lizard nesting season. Um, there's been a condition assessment of the stop bank and there's been some repairs to the estuary walkway. Um, the issues we're going to be talking to you about today are ones in which we were instructed to undertake further investigation or design works. I'll pass it over to Tom. So we'll talk about the two separate areas, South Shore and then South New Brighton. In both areas there's two issues, erosion and inundation. And I'll speak to South Shore first and Kelly will speak to um, South New Brighton with regards to erosion, I'll speak again about inundation in that area. So with regards to erosion in South Shore, there's a, um, a range of existing uh, erosion treatments along that edge that have been installed over a number of periods of time that are in varied states of repair, and the proposed approach in, as set out in the report is to take a unit by unit approach, um, primarily uh, focused on uh, rock revetment, but in one particular unit where there is some valuable edge vegetation to install a cobble beach and some offshore rock revetment. This is proposed or recommended by staff uh, rather than the alternative, which was the prioritised repair, which is more a structure by structure approach, which we have a lot of confidence in. In terms of inundation, the proposed approach is to construct a new bund immediately adjacent where possible to the Linz Bund and or immediately behind I should say. The other option we considered would be to set that bund back further into the uh, regeneration area there but we considered that the existing land use was of value to the community and there's a strong community preference there for keeping it close to the edge and the engineering preferences weren't strong with that regard. The bund itself would be built out of engineering material and uh, beyond the five metre setback that's proposed from the erosion treatment at the edge. This bund will provide benefit to about 450 properties in South Shore and you'll find that same number when I talk soon about South New Brighton because it acts like one sort of potentially one large flood cell in the water can transfer between the two, so that 450 homes reflects both South Shore and South New Brighton risk. There is residual risk, of course, with any engineering intervention with regards to both the erosion and the inundation. They're designed for a 20-year des design life, so if we get a, a large event greater than, say, a 50-year storm, we might expect to see some damage and some overtopping, or uh, should we get a future earthquake or some such. So there is some residual risk there associated with community expectation. Okay. Um, in 
South New Brighton with regard to the erosion. We have taken the August 19 resolution to restore the estuary edge and we've progressed to a more detailed design of how to achieve the intended erosion protection in the most practical manner. So just to note that this is not about the flood protection, this is purely about the erosion management. So we're noting that the environment has obviously changed post earthquakes and so it does, does require a slightly different approach to what was previously there. And so what's being proposed is that in areas where erosion is occurring behind the previous Reno mattress, uh, we're proposing to encase that with unconfined cobbles and that will achieve the same level of erosion protection that was there pre-earthquakes. In the steeper areas where um, the beach comes in and then it's quite a steep, steep bank, the treatment there will involve reinforcing the existing reno that's still there with, with some rock armouring. And then in the areas where the, the profile of the land has changed quite dramatically and there's, there's a um, beach forming, we're proposing to stabilise that with cobbles and also to try and establish some salt marsh to, to get that area nice and stable. And the salt marsh will be protected by a, a breakwater using the remaining Reno mattress that is now sitting offshore. So based on the, the resolution and the engineering advice that we've got, we think this is the, the best method of achieving the intention of the previous council resolution for erosion protection. Uh, it's also the approach that's most likely to gain resource consent when we consider the, um, the cultural values, the natural character and the ecological values of the area. And it's also adaptable. It's something that we can continue with and adapt as we go into the conversation about um, climate change. And so Tom will just talk about the, the inundation and flooding options. Thank you. So for inundation in this area, we are proposing a bund in order to manage the flood risk to those same properties that I mentioned earlier, because there is a potential for overland flow to pass through the campground and down into the South New Brighton, as far as South Shore. That bund is proposed to be set back from the edge in this instance, um, and which is consistent with the reserves development plan. There will be impacts of the bund. Um, tree removals will be required. We haven't um, settled on a number there, but that is something we have to evaluate as the design progresses, should you be um, wanting to progress this option. The um, bund itself would be constructed to a height of 11.5 in order to achieve the design height of 11.4. And the setback bund allows us to connect higher pieces of land. So overall, we believe the earthworks would be lower if we set it back from this reach. So moving on to the implications for the um, coming long-term plan. Um, the council resolu resolutions, a number of them reference that uh, funding should be prioritised with urgency for these pieces of work once the investigations had concluded. Um, that was in the pre-COVID environment. Obviously we're in the post-COVID environment now and there's a process underway with the long-term plan and the prioritisation of programmes within it. Um, we are recommending as staff that this, um, these pieces of work should be progressed as a bundle um, across the South Shore, South New Brighton area. Um, and the main reasons for that are that there are inter interdependencies in the effectiveness of the works in, in, um, between the areas and, and between the works within the areas. We've also um, undertaken a high level assessment of whether there might be some cost efficiencies in delivering the works in a coordinated way and we are able to estimate around about a $280,000 savings in, in delivering those works together. Um, there are also some significant probably staff time savings in, in doing so as well. Um, this slide really relates to the prioritisation of the bundle of works um, against other, other um, pieces of work that the Council will be um, considering as you progress your LTP. Um, we just wanted to bring to your attention the significant efforts that have been um, undertaken over the last year to rebuild trust with the community and meet their expectations of delivery of this piece of work. Um, some commitments were made in August last year and the community is very much hoping that those are honoured. Um, as mentioned before, there have been some um, concerns raised about wellbeing due to the ongoing uncertainty and the long-standing nature of these issues, we believe, requires a decisive resolution. Um, we also have noted, and it has been discussed already, that the delivery of these works will be necessary to ensure that we can move into that coastal hazards adaptation planning conversation that we're looking to have. 
So lastly, uh, this was a table that was in the council report, but it has been slightly amended. So in the council report, there was a slightly greater shortfall. The proposed um, the draft LTP proposals have been amended to the second part of that. Three waters have now um, increased the cap, uh, the amount allocated in the draft LTP to 6.1 million. So we're now looking at only a $900,000 shortfall in the current draft LTP. That was accurate. Um, if I may, I'm just um, going through this process. Um, we've obviously engaged significantly with the community, and I just want to thank the community for um, engaging with us on this work, and also particularly the community board, um, who we've worked with and um, engaged with on a regular basis, and Gary Teer as well individually. Mm. Um, who was nominated by the South Shore Residents Association as the um, technic their technical expert. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, just a couple of questions. Was, um, was uh, Gary Teer, did he only look at the South Shore aspects? Yes. So he didn't look at the South no. New Brighton ones? No, the resolution was only for South Shore and that's, um, he was nominated by the South Shore Residents Association so that was the scope of his work. Right. And, and to, can you just um, run through, because obviously there's some people from South New Brighton have uh, kind of looked at the uh, implementation of the resolution and seen that there are some differences in terms of the way the um, resolution uh, was passed last year, which I recall was uh, negotiated out the back <laughs> um, during a, a quick recess in order to try and find a, a resolution. Um, but this this is a this is a slightly different one after um, the engineering analysis has been done, uh, and so if you'd like to just walk us through that, so that councillors are really comfortable that the issue has been looked at thoroughly. Yes. Yeah, so um, we t we took the resolution that was passed last year, and um, staff have been doing work, and um, we believe. I, there was a couple of issues there. One was um, the gabion baskets. Were, were, there were no gabion baskets um, in place previously. And the second um, aspect was um, as, we, as the work was done to investigate what the best options were there, um, we believe we've come up with the appropriate options that um, meet the intent of that resolution. Okay. So, and um, from an engineering point of view, that the resolution wasn't able to be, I mean, it, it was, a, as I say, a cobbled together, this is cobbled now <laughs> in a different way, but um, resolution to try and get the, 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 the movement done, but you've now done the assessment. That's and correct. It is, right. Yes, yeah, so we've done the assessment, we've considered the resolution, we've done the assessment, and um, where we are now is where we, um, is, is the best place we can get to. Right, no, no, that's good. Thank you. Did anyone else have any questions? Would someone like to move this? James, seconded by Phil. Is there any debate? James? Okay. I just wanted to um, note that the community, the coastal community in, com in, in particular, will be watching this right now. I'm surprised that there aren't uh, more here right now, but it's, maybe it's just a timing issue. But there's been a lot of feedback over the last few days, and I've responded with those who have contacted me directly and personally, uh, whether it be in the street or via, via phone or email. And I just want to address a couple of the issues that have been raised. Firstly, though, I'll, I'll acknowledge the community in the sense that uh, they've been through a lot, in particular over the last five years or so, and I'm talking about the South New Brighton and uh, South Shore communities, but they have engaged and we've had good feedback. I also want to acknowledge the community board, as staff did, and the, com uh, the council staff themselves, because for the last five years or so, uh, it's been quite uh, a, a tough topic for our staff to uh, work on and particularly in the last 12 or so months since the uh, resolution in August last year. So we've gotten to this point here where part of the feedback, and, and I'll, I'll be frank, uh, some opposition has been to the uh, recommendation that doesn't specifically state 
the gabion baskets and reno mattresses. And I just want to assure anyone who cares about this, and, and our community does, that we have considered this as council and as community board and as council staff, and I believe that this is a stronger and better engineering solution for the issues that we have down there. So I'll put that on the table as I move this motion and um, leave the debate at that. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Uh, Phil. Yeah, I, I totally agree with James. The, um, even though it's not word for word what was in there last year, the, these guys have really put the effort in and have ad adjusted things or it, um, redesigned it, and it, I'm, I'm full confidence that it's going to work well. So I can't, can't wait to get on with it. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to say anything after hearing you say that, so <laughs> I will put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Much appreciated. Uh, future co-governance entity development and agile land use policy for the Otakaro Avon River Corridor. We've got Brendan Winder coming to the table. <coughs> I just want to um, acknowledge how much work has been done to um, work through this this issue. I think um, it uh, certainly does um, resolve a number of issues. So, um, it, it, are there any questions on that? I'd like to move this, but are there any questions on this? Would someone like to second the motion? Tim? I, I was looking at Phil. It, I mean, the, yeah, the, there's been a lot of work done on this, so I'll, it, if there's no debate, I'll, I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. It's carried. There you go. Thank you. And thank you for all the hard work, and say thank you to Andrew as well. Excellent. Uh, the Canterbury Multi-Use Arena Road Stopping Consultation. Sorry, who moved it? Aaron Kewan seconded uh, Phil um, thingy, Major. Major. <laughs> and there is a question from Yanni. Thanks. Um, just in light of what we heard the other day, that there's some sort of integrated transport assessment, I couldn't find any reference to that. Do we know when that's going to be complete and why are we doing this separate? from that I'm assessment. Sorry, I haven't been involved in that process at all, Yanni. This is just, maybe Mark can add to that, but. We do have a, sorry, I'm just gonna frog my throat. Um, we do have a draft integrated transport assessment that has been prepared by Oricon. Um, that is based on the proof of concept and that has been provided uh, out to prospective tenderers as part of the RFP. Um, what we'll do once we get a contractor on board, they will work um, with their design team to actually develop that draft integrated transport assessment. Just, just, I'm just kind of wondering like how we look at the big picture of the whole traffic network, because I think for some people the changes that have already been made were quite surprising in terms of what it did to the traffic flows. Have we got any sort of monitoring going on of what's actually happening with the road, the proposed roads, I mean the roads that have already been stopped mm. and how the traffic's impacts are minimised? Not at the moment, no, we're not doing any. I mean the, the two roads that are being closed, we have to close them because they, they go right through the site. And within the designation, yeah. which was consulted upon back in the blueprint. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. It, it says in here that the... Um, the designation was, con um, there was community engagement under the central, C C Crush at Central Recovery Plan, the blueprint, but as my understanding, there was no community engagement on that at all. Mm, okay. No, well, that was it was just placed there. I mean, we didn't, like, the community didn't get a say in that at all. Yeah. It's probably relevant now because Central City Recovery Plan is in place and we can't um, yeah. change okay. that. So, so it, should it, we focus it, on things we can change? So is it, is it, I mean, I guess it's a question for, for the transport people, but would it be worth getting some feedback with the initial, with these ones, in terms of what's happening with the traffic network and any sort of interim improvements or considerations? 
Is there any alternative to closing this road in terms of building the stadium? So no, I'm going to rule the question out of order. It's all right, Richard. Well, are we giving feedback? It's all right. I'm not going to accept the question, Yanni. I'm just moving on. So any other relevant questions? No? All right. I've got the um, resolution um, in front of me. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any debate? Aaron? Yeah, this is obviously pretty much just procedural, so I'd expect everyone to support it. But if it wasn't supported, just think of the carnage of cars crossing a playing pitch when there's a game on, like during a test. It'd be fine if they're at one end and the traffic goes through, but if you can't line up the traffic lowers, plus we've got extensive millions being proposed to be spent around traffic for this, um, and we, we, we're just basically being told that we can't, we can't understand the traffic impact. So we just close the roads, we don't think about what happens, and then we just deal with the consequence. And when these road closures actually came in, it did create a lot of confusion in the community. So you know, it does have impacts on local communities, what, what we're doing here. It's not something I think should just be um, shrugged off as some sort of joke. This impacts on local businesses, it impacts on local people that live in that neighbourhood who have to deal with the, the traffic Im impact. So I would have thought it would have been perfectly reasonable to expect that there is some sort of monitoring, but you've ruled it out of order, so we can't discuss it. I'm not saying that these roads shouldn't be closed. I just would have thought as part of the feedback, there should be some sort of monitoring to make sure that if there's things we can do to make it safer for the increase in traffic, that we consider it. One of the worst intersections in the city is Madras and Hereford going around that transitional cathedral, where we still have a 50k speed limit, and we've made streets a lot less dangerous, 30k makes no sense at all not to have a holistic approach to this. Right, well I will speak briefly. This is a very technical report. It simply um, contributes feedback um, on the proposed areas of road to be stopped. We have to stop the road here because this is where the designation sits for the, um, the multi-use arena and that's why it will um, proceed as requested. But I think it is important that we do look at um, overall traffic impacts, which will be part of the um, ongoing implementation uh, for the CMUA. So um, it's not relevant to this particular matter. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is miscellaneous amendments to delegations. And uh, we have... Um, a number of those sitting in front of us. Does anyone have any questions to this? Happy to move it, Sam, and seconded by Jake. Um, any questions? Any discussion? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Um, quarterly update on the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act Improvement Plan. I don't know whether you want to speak to that, Dawn. Uh, Sean is here. Oh, right. Okay, Sean. Hello. Um, well, just um, just uh, briefly, um, just an update. This is four months since we were last um, in front of you, um, and to give you some positive news that we have now either completed, initiated, or every recommendation of the Ombudsman's investigation of November last year is underway. So we have informed the Ombudsman of that today um, in his six monthly update. Um, some of the prime movers to embed this across the organisation have been increased training, which is now being extended to elected members. Um, the Lagoima team has now moved to a new database system, which was quite a large undertaking. Um, and one of the perceived weaknesses, one of the recommended changes we make um, to strengthen our capacity um, and another aspect too, which I should draw your attention to in the report, is a parallel process we've been working on releasing PX reports from primarily the last triennium. Um, we are now over 50% through that process, and that is a considerable amount of work. And to reflect that change, we have seen a marked reduction in the amount of PX information now going into PX, uh, sorry, into council, community boards and committees. Two years ago this was running at 35% in PX, it is now down to 5% of reports. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you wish. Does anyone have any questions? 
Uh, Yanni? Um, so um, at our board, we were told that ELT issued a directive that um, public uh, that briefings were public excluded and the public were um, generally unable to attend. Mm -hmm. We've had two cases where people have made deputations in public and then we've had information in the public excluded briefing where they've been um, where we've been told that they cannot attend. Has, are you aware of that sort of practice and how would we, if we wanted to change it, what's the process for us at a governance level to send a directive that it would be okay for people in the community to attend workshops or briefings where it's relevant to the issue that they've raised? Uh, Yanni, I don't think that that's yeah. an appropriate question for the person oh, okay. who's leading the work Sorry. on the improvement plan. I think that is a question for the chief executive and, uh, and I, I don't know whether the chief executive wants to respond to it. It's not relevant to this report. Oh, but I was just one A. Yeah, OK. So so it I, I, I do not understand that position. Briefings, if we have briefings for members where we're doing our workshop work, etc., those are our private working meetings and they are appropriate for us as your officers to brief you in other whatever matters that may be. We often also do briefings where the other parties are involved, including the public, and I'm looking at John, which is why he was nodding at me. And that's correct, John, isn't it? So your assumption, or where it's come from, I do not know, Yanni, but that is not the case. She, he was specifically Please. referring to community board meetings. So, so at a community board briefing, if, say, the elected members or the person that's made the deputation wishes to come to the briefing that's been scheduled, then what's the process to enable that person to attend? Because what we got told... No, Yanni, we've Yanni got the, I've just said no. that it's not appropriate for this report. Um, I gave the uh, chief executive an opportunity to respond to it, but right. John's come to the table, and so I will invite him to respond okay. to the question as it relates to community boards. But I'm going to assume that the process is the same, and that is it's on a case-by-case -case basis, as to whether um, it is um, a possibility for communities to be, um, community members to be involved, and it will depend on the circumstances and whether confidential advice is being provided or not. But John, that, that's that's exactly right, uh, Leanne. And uh, perhaps if if Yanni can provide me with details of the situation, uh, we can. Uh, uh, provide a reply and circulate it to all other councillors. I think that, that there was an example, and I'll use one oh, that's, that's done and dusted. There was an example um, a couple of years ago uh, where, the, uh, where there was an issue around the, the district plan and uh, which subsequently led to some changes being made in the district plan. The um, information was provided in a, in a setting which didn't result in the matter um, coming forward to the council, and so therefore, uh, you know, the, it, it wasn't it wasn't a transparent process, and that didn't assist in people's interpretation of what they had been advised. So sometimes I think it's better to have a transparent process. But you're you're saying that on a case by case basis, that can be dealt with. Is, like, in terms of changing the policy set, in which, as I understand at the moment, briefings are public excluded, unless... Look, uh, Yanni, briefings are private. They're, right. they're not public excluded. They're yeah. not open to the public. They're in not the first subject place. to Lagoima. They're not, they're not subject... To, well, they, they are subject to Lagoima. Oh, I'm sorry, the, a, the Meetings Act, pardon me. They're not yeah. under the Meetings Act yeah. side of things, but they are under the Official Information yeah. So what I'm really interested in is things. how we get greater transparency of those briefings, and is there a, a way that we can have more Yanni, of them... I'm them saying, yes, you public. can raise this okay. issue, just not here and now. Right. And so, then the other question I have was around the local governance statement. I appreciate staff have just sent a response through. So we didn't get to sign that off, even though it's a governance statement. And I know, I think I was told three years ago, we didn't sign it off either. So I just find it weird at a governance level, we wouldn't sign off on a governance statement that sets out the principles by which we operate, including issues like transparency and access to information. It is, is, I'm just interested in how it's gone from being signed off by governance to now not being signed off by governance? I, I can discuss that. I'm just questioning whether I should in, in this forum now. But I, I can certainly give the information. 
No, look, I, I haven't read anything that's come right. through from staff, so uh, let, let, let us take this offline and um, it, can be, it can be addressed. Um, it's been moved and it's been seconded, so it was moved by Sam, seconded by Jake. Um, is there any discussion? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, feedback to provide consultation on the potential mad mandate of the government procurement rules to local government. And. Uh, So does anyone have any questions on this one? No? Pauline? I'm just wondering if we could get just a brief overview. I know we've got it here, but we're basically opposing. Oh, sorry. OK. No, I'll hand over to staff. Thank you. Thanks. I'm trying to understand how it actually impacts us locally, because it seems concerning. But when I read through it, I can't quite see what it exactly means for us. Yeah. Perhaps a brief overview can answer that question at the same time. Thank you. Yeah. So um, obviously you can see that MB have proposed mandating their procurement government rules. A little bit of background from our perspective is we obviously have our own procurement framework rules. Those rules were put into place to underpin our procurement policy, which was obviously um, something that council wanted. So that touches um, to, on to local market obviously because we've got our council strategic outcomes and our procurement policy and our framework ensures that we deliver those strategic outcomes so um they've opened up for consultation you can see in 5.2 of the report that um they've stated why they would like to consider mandating the procurement government rules 5.3 they've also noted where they feel that there would be an impact likely cost impact to councils if they were to mandate this and we would agree with those points as well. You'll also note in 5.5.4 that we've talked about very specific rules that we think would be a bit of an issue for us because they would potentially oppose what we're trying to achieve and would potentially take some decision making away from this council. So I'll give you an example of that, the all of government contracts. So at the moment there is an option as to whether we use the all of government contracts and under the proposed rules we would be mandated to. Now, one of the issues we have with that is there's a lack of information in regards to how that would be imposed and what that would mean. So, in, the, in, in terms of the all of government contracts, there may well be um, a lot of supplies that aren't Christchurch based or local based that we would perceive as local based. It might preclude us from awarding to our CCOs or CCTOs. There may be, um, is there, is, it may cause a monopoly in the market because obviously, if we're going to make the whole of public sector use the same contracts that could cause that and also there's things around local market um, capacity and the capacity of your um, AOG. Now I'm not saying they haven't done that analysis but if they have we haven't been privy to it so there's some of our concerns. I think one of the other things to know is as I've said our procurement framework rules have been aligned very clearly to what we want to deliver. We've also got a really big section in our current rules around contract management, operational contract management and you'll note in the government rules, there's nothing on that. Now, the Office of the Auditor General made it very clear to us that that's really important to them. So we can't see the connection with the, with the rules. And actually, we've, we've made leaps and bounds in that space. We've been praised by the Office of the Auditor General for that. And we wouldn't want to take a step back. Again, I, I don't know whether it means we could impose some of our own rules around that, but it's not clear in the submission. You will also have seen the uh, Society of the Local Government Managers' response as part of this paper. So you can clearly see their opinion on it and they, they don't seem they want to support that. And a lot of other councils are saying the same thing according to that report. And so our proposed submission has been considered around their rules and our rules and whether or not they align to our strategic outcomes and whether or not it would take that decision making away from this council. Would there be any risk to the panels which have been working very effectively? Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Pauline? Yeah, just um, would it be um, good to include that 
um, comment around the praise from the Auditor General for our current policy. That's number one. And secondly, would this um, mandate from the government pre uh, prevent us from bringing some things back in house that we might have talked about previously? Um, the first one, yes, we can definitely talk about that in the submission. Yep. The second one, as far as I am aware, there was there was no rule within their rule book that says we couldn't consider best value, and that might mean bringing in house. I highly doubt it's in there, but I would have to go and check it. Uh, it would probably be a Yanni. process, wouldn't it? Yanni? So, so basically this forces councils to adopt the government procurement? Yeah, right? yes. entirely. Yeah. So I think in terms of submission, did we think about putting some examples? I mean, I, I presume this would like things like Red Bus, where we had direct negotiation with ECAN for one of the routes, or for all of them, but things like that direct negotiation between um, CCOs and regional or local government? Would that be excluded if this was to go ahead? It would be impacted. I'm right. sure there are, we've got our own departure processes, there probably are departure processes that they would follow, but it wouldn't be as simple when we would need certain approvals that outside of these okay. walls that we don't currently So need. I just wondered in terms of the submission of maybe having like some tangible examples, yep. and I would have thought things like maybe Red Bus, yep. is now owned you no know, by a Canadian pension fund. Yep. Sorry, the bus services are owned by a Canadian pension fund, not Red Bus. Uh, I think it's fair to say that it, it is unclear, a lot of um, points that are not clear in the information that the Ministry has prepared, including what they're trying to achieve and what problem they're trying to solve right. by um, potentially imposing these rules on the Council. Okay. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a, lot of a, a number of questions that they, they would, it would be great to get some more information from the Ministry on. Yeah. Cool. I just think examples are quite useful in submissions, so it makes yeah. it real for people. Outline, ask them what the problem is that they're trying to solve yeah. for a start. I think that would be a good idea. It's a very good place to start when you're regulating. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Define the problem. The way you've used the word vehemently in the first line, I think That's it's good. Helen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. All right. So, Pauline, would you like to move this then? Yes, happy to move it. Yep. Anyone like to second it? Yeah. Melanie? Could you just take on board maybe to think of some examples to put in? That would yeah. We can do yeah. that. Yeah. Yes, um, well, myself and the um, Chief Executive will sign off the final submissions, so we'll be looking for examples and we'll be looking for the reference to the Auditor General. Oh, sorry, just, just one thing. Um, Remember that closeout report we got on that skate park, which was really, really interesting around how they used someone from the Hawke's Bay, but we actually got really good competitive prices. Just a small local contractor. Really good example, I think, of what could possibly be at risk. We'll, we'll look for yeah. examples, yep. Yeah, Thank that you. would be no problem. Yeah. All right, we've, it's been moved and seconded. I'll put, sorry, the seconder was Melanie. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the draft uh, 2021 schedule of council meetings. Hopefully, there's no questions. We did. Um, I think one of the, one of our recess weeks is in a school holidays, and one of them isn't. So that we managed to provide one that did and one that didn't. Um, I think and. Uh, yeah, so, um, but we need to get these in the diary, so, happy to move? Yes, one question. Yeah, because the, the multicultural community because I change from the once every two months to the fourth and fourth time. But regarding to the second of the meeting time, because first time is the third of April, the second time is the March, the end of March, it's not the eighth of April. I'm concerned between the second time to the uh, third time. It's almost uh, five months, too long. Whether it's possible, you know, to squeeze the second time, maybe the end of April is possible swap. It's not uh, from April, actually it's uh, 31st of March. Whether can swap, you know, either to the 24th. Sorry, what? Um, the multicultural committee, committee, the meeting time.
second and third are too long. This is five months almost. So why did you want to move it to, Jimmy? No, no, 31st the meeting. Yeah. And, why, and you want it to... Shift to, to the April, April, because you mentioned four times, one is February, April, then the August, the, the November. But each your second time, sir. So, so I can make March. a note to look at the April meeting and see where I can move it to. But not the April, it's March. The can March. you shift to yeah. April? Um, the April. But it yes. seems odd that it's February, April anyway. Yeah, it's actually the 31st of March, but we can, we yes, can but, look. But why is it oh, February? Oh, you changed already. February and then yeah, the No, you didn't change. It says multicultural quarterly, quarterly February, April, August, November. Oh, that's, I think it's... It's the 31st. Yeah, so normally it would probably meet in May, but because of LTP, I put it in April, but it's right at the beginning, which... No, not April. The it's the 31st of March. March. No, it's the 31st of March, so I can look at moving that to yeah. somewhere I later want to in April. April. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, okay. so you're sick on the third yeah. time, five yeah, months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be moved. We'll, we'll yeah, have yeah. a look, right. okay. but yeah. the Thank difficulty... You. Well spotted. Sorry, Councillor Chen, is that we've got... Um, Easter, Anzac, recess. So we're trying to cram, but we'll ha we'll have another look. I'll have another yeah, you'll have a look. There. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because why? I'm also concerned. Multi advisor group, no, they need to report to our committee. Yes. Well, it may Too be long. possible to move it into May. It's yes. a short meeting that you could um, put in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The beginning between, of May. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Sorry. Yes, yeah. But the, the principle's right, the quarterly yeah. meetings, and we'll just get the exact date signed yes. off. Okay. Um, the, the, these are just the, the, the schedule of meetings. We, we may need to make changes to the schedule as necessary to meet circumstances as required. So it's been moved and seconded. So I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much, Sam. You put in thank a you. lot. Of, you and Megan have put in a lot of effort into that, so thank you. Now we go back to Cranford Street, um, item number thirteen. Um, no, no, and um, it may be that um, we we may not be in a position to proceed with the paper today. So um, I'm just. Uh, I know that staff have been talking, that they've had some meetings, that there's been some discussions going on, and it may be that, the, that um, rather than take any motions on this at this stage, I might uh, leave it be at the moment, because I'm holding back the, the potential to put the matter, leave the matter lie on the table, and bring it back to an extraordinary meeting so that it just gives a little bit more time for all of the technical um, aspects to be to be worked out. But um, I think that's where we've got to, but um, I'm in your hands. No, we're in yours. Um, no, we'd, we'd be happy to come back um, in a couple of weeks if that meets the members' expectations. And based on the... Um, deputations made today by our partners. It'll be good to work through some issues with them and hopefully come back with um, some solutions that uh, kind of everyone's more comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah, you can ask a question. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to stop questions because it's it, it is an important issue. But I, I will say that I'm I'm I wasn't of the view that we should defer this this morning. Um, I am of the view that we should now, after having taken into account all of the submissions that's come through from strategic partners, because I think the message in terms of working collaboratively on that on our corridors is one that outweighs the the, the specifics of getting to an answer today. So, um, Pauline. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you just tell me um, regarding? Um, Dr Shane Turner's report and both the, that and the Jacobs report, were they aware or had ECAN made the decision to both increase the frequency of the Route 28 bus or bring in the express bus at the time that they'd completed that report? And the reason I'm asking is because one of the comments in the Jacobs report 
is that the existing bus route does not cater well for the local community. And Shane Turner's also put a comment in about the bus, um, the routes would need an overhaul before he looked at a bus lane. So I'm wondering if they were aware of the ECAN's intention to increase the, um, the 28 and put in the express lane before they signed those reports off. And I mean, if you don't know the answer to that, it, you, yeah. you don't need to know it right now. I think um, Pauline's <coughs> signalling an area that we would want some more That's information cool. on. I think it's probably best that I come back to you on that one. Yeah. But I think come back as part of the holistic package. Yep. Yanni, did you have a specific question? Yeah, just um, what, what struck me this morning was that ECAN aren't in the group that's collaborating on this project, and I just wanted to check. Um, Yanni, I, what was clear this morning was that there was, um, there was a disconnect in relation to both. We had ECAN here, we yep. had the Waimakariri District no, no, I, Council I get that. Mayor Sorry here. Yeah, we so, had we had all of those um, people here. Yeah, but council, um, NZTA, and um, WIMAC are, are together on this kind of collective, and ECAN aren't. Is that no? The, the Greater Christchurch or? Partnership involves all of the strategic no, no, partners. I, yeah, so that was kind of my point, really, is that the GCP, which seems to be the the kind of better vehicle for this to be considered. Because, but what I thought this no, morning was no, no it's not NZTA, because it is not Wymac, it doesn't include us. Selwyn, um, it only includes Wamakariri, um, ECAN, NZTA, and ourselves, and um, it, it is really important that we get this right. So I rather sorry, than, all, all I was trying to understand at a very high level is if, if there's a working group or a joint working no, party there together. No, there isn't a disconnect in that regard. There's a disconnect on this one issue. Oh, okay. But it's not with ECAN, it's right across no, the No, no, I know it's not with ECAN, but I didn't know if ECAN were in that kind of ongoing project thing around this whole corridor. Yes. They are. It, look, we've, we've had a program steering group which has been operating for a few years. It has been in abeyance for several months now yeah. as we have kind of got to the nutty end of the but process. But ECAN's with, on that group. ECAN have been Great. on that group. Fantastic. Yep. That's all I wanted to check. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so on, on that basis, oh, Mike. Just one question, and, and you can come back to me, but um, I, I just feel that obviously the designation and conditions are actually having a massive impact on the community and will continue to have that. Um, so I just want to know the process of actually lifting the designation. Yeah. I think that could be form part of the advice that you provide us as well, because obviously that's a that would be a significant um, piece of work, but it might, I mean, I'm hearing a community that's desperate for an answer. Um, I'm desperate for us to really back the decision that's been made up in Waimakariri, which is to, um, to, to that, you know, they've made a, a good decision to have the park and ride enabled. Um, ECAN's making good decisions in terms of that express bus um, and you know, I, w I want us to be joined at the hip. And if the designation is part of that problem, I do want us to have good legal advice around that. So, um, if that could be picked up in the report back as well. Yes. Yep. Was there anything else that people wanted to raise? Because if that's the case, I'll, I'll just leave the matter lie on the table, and uh, we will call a. Um, an extraordinary meeting, which will be extraordinary other than it's not timetabled. Can you just give me a moment and we have got a suggested time for a meeting. Oh, okay. So, for you, um, after the Sustainability and Community Resilience Committee on Thursday the 23rd of November. Okay. 12 noon, um, and hopefully we can get a public hour available, allowing for a lunch agenda. Which so is, we'll all right. put that into a resolution. All right. Which is nearly two, nearly two weeks away. Okay, we can resolve the meeting time by. Well, can't we just call the meeting? Um, well, if we resolve to hold it. Oh, if we resolve to hold it, then I'd, it doesn't have to be an extraordinary meeting. Yeah, it'll still be an extraordinary. Extra just resolve to hold it. I don't have to do a requisition for a meeting. Okay, so um, the, the, a resolution will come up on the board that the council leave the report to lie on the table to be considered um, 
at an extraordinary council meeting to be held on what date? 25th. On the Thursday, the 25th of November. Sorry, it's, uh, it's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. At 12 noon. You've got the, you've got the wrong date. It's usually on a Wednesday. Thursday the 26th or Wednesday the no Thursday the 26th all right at 12 noon <laughs> yeah it, 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 we'll, we would ha have a it, it means there'll be a longer adjournment um, but at 12 noon we can break from where we are up to on the other meeting and have this meeting so relatively light all right so um, I'll move that, seconded by Mike Davidson. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, I will now move that we um, uh, go into uh, uh, public excluded for all of the reasons set out on the agenda. Um, do I have a seconder for that? Andrew, I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much.